I'm Carol Ridford and I'm one of the senior cancer nurses at the Royal Surrey County Hospital and I'd like to welcome you here today to actually our second health and wellbeing event. We held one in December uh, which was very successful. We had about 120 attendees um, from that. Um, we, we were aiming to hold probably a couple of these a year so that we capture um, other, other people as well that missed the December event. I'm going to do a very, very brief introduction because we are sort of five, five minutes behind now and we've got quite a lot of people to get through So, and I really want you to hear what they've got to say. So as I say, welcome to everybody uh, and thank you for coming. Um, it's really good to see you today and uh, you know, nice to see a, a mixed audience as well and, and I, I'm assuming there are patients, carers, families here today as well to join into the event. And I'd also like to thank all of the staff, the charities that have come along as well to, to, to be available, to give you advice, uh, answer your questions uh, today if they can. We've held, as I say, we've held a lot of events locally um, and um, we are conscious that some of our patients, particularly after treatment, feel that they lack the support, uh, somebody to communicate with. So the idea of these events is actually to give you the ability to find out what services are out there. There may be things today you find out that you didn't know about. And, and if, if, if we do today, you actually finding out what is out there, then we've done what we set out to because we know there is a bit of a gap probably following treatment and um, you know sometimes whilst you're on treatment sometimes you don't realize what's available as well so hopefully this will be an informative day for you um, so really uh, just as i said we're holding this really to give you uh, the ability to find out about information um, services that are out there that can support you and your family um, we can't do everything in a day. We can't do. Um, we can't give um, discussions on specific cancer types either. So this is very generic information, right across all the different cancer types. Um, and some of the focus today will be about giving you um, information and advice about dealing with the the emotional distress associated with cancer and its treatments. And we have a clinical psychologist that will be talking to you about that. Um, other things like benefits, financial support, thinking about going back to work, lifestyle issues, diet, exercise, uh, talking a little, uh, you know, having people available to talk a little bit about the consequences of the treatment that you have as well. You may have questions around that. And as I said, support from families and carers. Um, I've also said we've got a lot of people on the stand. So please, in the breaks, go and visit, ask questions. If something's not out there, come to us and let us know. Um, hopefully you've all got a, a, a pack which tells you what the programme is today. Uh, I've headed that up today. Um, so we've got uh, built in um, some refreshments in the middle of the morning. So please feel free to walk around our stands, which are both out there and around the corner in the foyer. Um, and then we, we'll follow that with some lunch. Um, and then a few more speakers in the afternoon, and then an opportunity again for you to wander around the stands. It's important for us to get this right as well, and we did at our last event have um, a little bit of feedback, and hopefully we've done that. We've got a bigger room this time, because uh, in fact last time we um, booked in 100, but 120 arrived. So <laughs> we, we had to, to, to do that. Um, we've also today, um, um, I've thankfully managed to get a couple of patient stories as well, patients to talk to you, um, which I think I know from other events that I've run, it's often quite useful to the audience to, to, to hear what other experiences are out there. Um, and we have got some other stands out there which is more local support. Um, and also um, some of the presenters, because the timetable is quite tight, we don't have time for lengthy questions after each one, but the presenters, will I be here part of the day or, or, or all day if you want to ask me questions at the break time. Just finally, um, housekeeping. Um, the toilets are outside, not in this lobby, just a bit further along on the left hand side. There are um, hotel staff around or where around if you get lost or you need some assistance. 
I don't think there's any fire alarms for, no, for today. No, no, they cancel it. Uh, they're just for you guys. So <laughs> if, if, if there is not a practice of harm, but at an actual fire, we will uh, we will help you to get towards the car park at the front. Um, and if I can ask you, if you've got any mobile de devices to put those on silence, I need to remind myself of that as well. Okay. So uh, please make full use of the day, and I hope you enjoy uh, what you're about to hear today. I always feel slightly daunted, um, but very honoured to be with a whole group of patients um, in a room like this. So, and the, um, you know, I think the important thing about this is that this is your journey, and this is your recovery package. We'll talk a bit about the recovery package, but all of us are individuals. We all have our own stories, <coughs> and our cancers or your cancers have affected you and your families in different ways. Um, and I see that so much when I meet my patients in the practice. The thing about cancer for us as GPs is, if you have a list size of 2,000 patients, you are probably going to see nine new cases a year. So it's not a huge amount of what we do, but as you will see, it is going to become a much bigger part of what we do as more people are surviving. And I quite often feel when my patients are, are diagnosed with cancer, they disappear off into the hospital, and then they come back out and they do feel as if they've come off a bit of a conveyor belt and they don't quite know what to do when their treatment's finished. So this is a bit about that part of the cancer journey. Okay, so I work in um, uh, Binsken Medical Centre, but as Carol said, I'm also a Macmillan GP. And within that role, I've been really privileged to be able to look at cancer and end-of-life care in a bit more detail and just see if there's ways we can improve things. And actually the most important thing is getting feedback from people like you, um, people, carers, especially if, if someone has died, you know, how that went, how, how we can just improve things. Because if we don't hear from you, we can develop services, but they might not be what is useful actually for the people we're providing them for. And I think, you know, it's really important that we listen to patients. So within our CCG, so it's Guildford and Waverley area, 21 practices, and that's about 220,000 patients. So as I said, we're here because we want to look at improving um, the care for people who are living either with their cancer or after they've had their treatment and been cured with the consequences of their treatment. Um, and we know that more people are surviving um, longer, but there are lots of unmet needs out there. And if we organise ourselves a bit better, we might be able to help a bit better as well. And the government, in their five-year forward view, have really put cancer on the agenda, um, and especially this part of the cancer pathway, the recovery part. So, as I said before, uh, there are 2.5 million people living with cancer. That number's increasing, and we're predicting about 4 uh, million people in 2030. And if you look at this, is the reason why, because if you look, the survival times have increased. Um, I mean, these are, this is uh, a Macmillan slide, so fairly old data, 2007. Um, but you can see how, over time, survival um, has uh, increased. So if you have a, have a look at the pathway here, this first bit, if you like, is the diagnosis and treatment, but look at all of this afterwards, okay? So there's a lot of rehabilitation needed, early monitoring, so you might be coming up to the hospital for scans, but late monitoring, you know, what about my side effects from my chemotherapy? Who's going to look after that bit of it? Maybe you have a recurrence of your illness, um, and then the end of life care. So the whole thing, the whole thing is increasing in time, which is a great, I mean, it's a fantastic success story, but there's a lot of unmet need in that. And so we know that certain cancers, the survival rates are better than others. Once again, an old slide, and I would have hoped that things have improved a bit, but we know that certain cancers, and once again, I'm, I'm, I apologise if if this is um, a cancer that you're suffering from but, um, or have experience of, but um, we know that certain cancers um, people don't do so well, and I know that just from my clinical experience seeing patients, 
who had perhaps stomach cancer or esophageal cancer, uh, but that others are improving. Um, and you know, it's a, it, you know, you know, when I when I was a medical student, cancer was just such a horrible, horrible illness, and it still is. But there's so much more hope now, and so much more treatment out there. And for me, seeing that, it's it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. But as I said, not everyone's living well. So we know that there are people living out there with the consequences of their treatment. We'll talk about that in a bit. And also because we have people surviving who are older, they have other what we call comorbidities, so they might have lung disease already, they might have heart failure already, um, they might have high blood pressure, they might have mental health illnesses, so they might have dementia. So there's a group of people who cancer is only part of their, of their um, illness history, if you like, story. And then we know that all cancer survivors um, run the risk of their cancer coming back. And people have to live with that psychologically. I know that that's difficult for people. And so this just really illustrates the other um, comorbidities. It's a, it's a bit of a fussy slide. We won't, we won't worry too much about that. OK, so consequences of treatment. So my patient list, because I work three days a week, is about 1,500 patients. There are about 15 patients on my list who have consequences of their cancer treatment. I honestly, they probably occasionally mention it to me, um, but I think this is really important, that actually if you've had cancer and you've got over it, you know, should you really complain about the side effects of your treatment? I mean, after all, you've survived your cancer. Well, actually, you should. Come and tell us, because there are things that can be done, all right? So don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel that it's a trivial problem and that you should be grateful for where you are, because there are things that can be done. <coughs> Everyone's different. Well, I said that at the beginning. We're all unique. And the, site, the uh, consequences of treatment can be physical and psychological. And we'll talk a bit about some of those um, physical and psychological uh, side effects. And I just like this slide because actually it just shows that the consequences affect all different parts of your body. So you might have hair loss, body image issues, so psychological problems fatigue, mental health problems, swallowing problems, problems with your heart, lungs, sexual, um, you know, lack of libido, uh, lack of confidence, so your sexual, um, you have problems with your sex life, um, urinary bowel problems, nausea, vomiting, you know, the list, the list, the list goes on, but it's not all bad news, I'm going to point, uh, uh, you know, paint a really grim picture, because there are things that we can help and we are much more aware of these uh, problems now than we ever used to be. So fatigue. I understand that this is, I mean, I get tired, but I understand this is really debilitating fatigue. And some of you who've been through this will know, actually, even doing one job, you know, one bit of housework in a day will be an issue. Um, the good news about this is there is evidence that exercise helps. Okay, so just, I know it's difficult, but staying active helps. And, you know, there's uh, Macmillan who do the walking for health. Um, I'm a really keen uh, runner, and there's um, Park Run, which is a very supportive five-kilometer run uh, that happens all over the country. There are things that you can start gradually getting back into. Um, and we know that actually if you're fit and healthy before you have your cancer and before you have your cancer treatment, you do well, you do better. All right, so just, and get it out there, get people exercising, family and you know. So we know that that helps. Sexual difficulties, well it may be physical things, so that if you've had treatment for your prostate cancer, you know, Viagra might help, or there are other um, uh, devices that can help. Um, but it may well be, or if you're, if you're um, a, a woman and you've, been gone, you've had to go through a sort of early menopause and getting horrible hot flushes and sweats and things, then there is treatment which is non-hormonal that can help. Just, you have to flag it up, okay? 
Don't be embarrassed about it. Come and talk about it. The other thing about it is the psychological effects. So, you know, lack, um, lack of self-confidence, body image, all those things. Come and talk about it. Okay. Mental health problems. I mean, I think the caption there, I don't know if you can all read it, but... Um, you know, a mum who had a, um, a little baby who was seven months old and uh, with uh, breast cancer and used to cry herself to sleep worrying about, about that and that, that she might die <coughs> and that she might leave her husband with her young uh, baby. So we know that this has huge psychological effects on people, almost like a post-traumatic stress type of thing and people need psychological support, and there is help out there. If you've had pelvic radiotherapy, um, uh, you know, you might have, or surgery, you might have urinary symptoms or bowel symptoms, um, and you might need changes to your diet, so dietitians can help us, um, and but there is some medication that can help, and um, there are people that we can refer you to. If you've had radiotherapy or surgery to your head and neck, you may have a dry mouth, problem swallowing. Once again, come and tell us. Really important that you don't lose weight because of this, because you need to keep strong. Um, lymphedema, so this is swelling of arms or uh, arm or leg, depending on um, where your cancer's been. Perhaps you've had surgery for your cancer that would cause it. Once again, really important that we're on top of this. A lot of breast cancer patients are referred almost routinely uh, to see the lymphedema clinic um, to try and prevent this from happening and so that people know what to do um, if they get uh, insect bites, things like that. You need to look after yourself. Heart health, we know, as I said before, if your heart's nice and healthy beforehand, before you have your chemotherapy, then you're going to do better. But some of the chemotherapies actually affect your heart. And I thought this was really interesting because the patient who's uh, quoted actually felt so poorly with his chemotherapy, he wasn't really sure whether um, he was feeling poorly because of the chemo. But in fact, it was because he had a heart problem, which was picked up routinely when he went for his checkups. Okay, so the hospitals are aware of what your treatment does to you, um, and they should be letting you know, and they should be keeping an eye on things. So, through all those slides, there was um, some really good leaflets Macmillan have produced. I, I mean, they are an amazing, amazing organisation. Absolutely fantastic. I love working for them. And they produce some fantastic information. So please do, um, you can go onto the website. I know there is a few uh, leaflets at the back there, Shirley's at the back there with a few that may be relevant to you, but if not, then if you, you can go onto the website um, and pick them up. And I just want to say again, physical activity. If I could beat that drum, you know, I could probably <coughs> prescribe so much less medication if people exercise, and it doesn't have to be huge amounts. Um, and it doesn't have to be to high levels, but just anything more than what you're doing at the moment. All my patients, I would say. Okay, so the recovery package, we'll just talk a little bit about that. It's, there's four components of it, and you may or may not be aware that you have had one of, you know, something has been done in, in the recovery package for you, because it won't necessarily have hit you in that, in that way, but we'll go through them and you'll be able to see. But it has been developed and tested, and actually it is in the five-year forward view for cancer that the recovery package should be implemented for patients who've had cancer. And we'll talk about it so you can understand what that is. So the first part of it is something called a holistic needs assessment. <coughs> this, I mean, I, you know, I would say you've probably all had one because you have talked to your cancer nurse specialists and they will be asking you how you're feeling, what, what problems you're having at the moment, um, you know, is there anything that we can do to help you get through this um, this diagnosis and journey. 
But whether it's been formalised or not is something a bit different. And um, there are electronic uh, forms, uh, which some people might have filled in, that they, um, they McMillan did a pilot. Um, and I don't think we were involved in that, but there, there, there are electronic forms. This is the form that we use um, in our practice. Um, and it basically, there are lists of problems, and you tick um, the four that are the most relevant, and then you can put them on a scale, what's called a distress thermometer, to find out you know, how, how much they are affecting you. I'll tell you what we do in our practice in a minute. Uh, so the holistic needs assessment. So that's your way of saying, actually, I'm really struggling psychologically, or I've got this pain um, here, or whatever it might be. Treatment summaries are something which the hospital should be sending to the GP, and I personally feel should be coming to you as well. This is your treatment, this is what you've been through, and what we are working to do is to get the, um, G, uh, the treatment summary to include a list of the medication and the potential side effects so that, so that I as a GP know that your chemotherapy might give you tingling in your fingers or, and feet. Um, and, and so I know what to look out for. I don't know all the different chemotherapies. You're probably more expert than I am, I'm sure, in terms of your treatments. Um, but, you know, if we're given a bit of guidance, then we all know what to do. So that's something that we are still working at, um, and we've made some inroads locally, uh, the Royal Surrey and the local hospitals on that one. Health and wellbeing events, well that's this sort of thing. Um, so trying to give people information, um, let people know what's, uh, what's out there, um, and how they can help themselves. And then the fourth part of the um, uh, recovery package is the cancer care review. Now, this is the thing that I think you probably won't be aware that you've had, because I'm not quite sure how things are run in your practice, but someone should be giving you a phone call, or at least or seeing you, phone call at the least, um, within about six months of your diagnosis, just to check that you all are all right. What we do in our practice is our practice nurse has done um, a, a Macmillan course and now she does the cancer care reviews because she has a teeny bit more time but also she has got some expertise, probably more than some of the GPs have, in terms of knowing where to send people um, if they have problems, signposting them to the Fountain Centre which is our local um, uh, uh, support uh, centre for patients who've had cancer or are going through cancer treatment. So, but if you're not sure whether, whether you've had one or not, then just when you, when you go and see your GP next, just say, oh, could I have a cancer care review? Just because I think, actually, that this, oh, this one, that this needs to be developed in practices. And at the moment, it's a bit of a tick box, um, and I think there's an awful lot of potential and as I say, our practice nurse has done the course and we've all got behind her and um, feel very encouraged by what she's doing. That's the other thing. Speak to your practices, see if they can get a pra one practice nurse from the practice to go on the um, Macmillan course because they are a great source of support for patients. I don't know why you love nurses so much and why you don't come and talk to us because we'd love to see you, but actually people do find it easier to talk to their nurses sometimes. So um, the other things that are coming up, um, we know that people are going to be uh, surviving longer uh, with their cancer and that the hospital can't keep following patients up. It's going to be really tough, there's going to have to be a bit of change involved, um, but there's going to be a real drive for... Um, putting the wrong thing for self-management, um, changing follow-up so that you come out of the hospital system perhaps sooner, but that your GP and, your, and you yourself know what it is that would take you back into hospital, all right? 
Um, so there's a lot of work going on about changing follow-up because the hospitals just can't cope. I mean, that you know, with with how things are going, they need to concentrate much more at the front end and getting people treated, um, diagnosed and treated. So. Um, Coming up in uh, when, winter 2016, there's going to be some more information about that from Macmillan. Um, okay, so as I said, Macmillan resources that you can order. There's lots and lots of different things that are available. Um, do have a look um, and, and just, it, it, it's a fantastic organisation. That's, um, that's my um, email address. I'm always very conscious that, um, you know, we have events like this and that um, you might have something that you want to say or you might have something that comes to you later on and you think, oh gosh, you know, it'd be really good if, you know, why don't they try doing this? Why doesn't my GP think about? Can you send me an email? Because I just don't know how to capture your... Um, capture your thoughts and ideas easily otherwise. Um, I'm really lucky I can go back to the CCG and I can say actually, you know, <coughs> a patient said this, they do listen um, and if they can and if we can, we will try and change things. We haven't got a bottomless pit of money but there is going to be more funding for the NHS. But sometimes it's just tweaking things and reorganising things and it isn't a, about a huge amount of uh, financial uh, input. Okay, so please do um, please do email me, and that's me done. Thanks to everybody for coming, and thanks so much for inviting me to talk today. I also just want to thank Karen for her talk, and I think that here in Guildford and where I'm based, the Royal Surrey, we're we're really lucky to have the local GPs that we have because they're so committed to um, working with us and to try and develop you know the best services possible for patients. So. I thought that was an excellent talk and I also have to apologise because there is some slight overlap in some of my slides so I'll try and whiz through them uh, quickly but uh, there is a little bit of overlap so sorry about that. Um, so my name's Kath and I'm a consultant in supportive and palliative care at the Royal Surrey. Um, I work with Joe Thompson who's at the back there um, and I'm really going to be talking about the supportive care aspect of my job and a specific clinic that we run dealing with supportive care um, for cancer, for people living with cancer and beyond. Okay, is it the bottom one forward? Yes. Aha! <laughs> um, so supportive care, I mean, I think it's quite difficult. There's a lot of terminology that's used and bandied around quite a bit, but what, we, what we're really referring to when we talk about supportive care is, is managing um, adverse effects of cancer, but more specifically cancer treatments. I mean, Karen has, has talked about this quite, quite a bit, but I think it's to reiterate that it's, it's really from diagnosis throughout treatment and beyond treatment. So it's, it's at any stage in, in, in people's journey and people's diagnosis, um, and that's what supportive care refers to. Um, okay, this is the... Um, the most recent document, and this is a, a government department of health initiative, um, and it's it's produced some, a framework really for what we, you know, what we should be doing and um, what the needs are of, of people that are experiencing cancer treatments um, and also after treatment, and it talks about a whole whole lot of unmet needs through kind of various questionnaires, um, but what I'm going to talk specifically about today is is managing the, the consequence and side effects of, of cancer treatments. By cancer treatment, we're referring to so any of these really, and people that I see often have one, they often have two, sometimes all three. So, and I think, I think the, the effects that people experience can, can vary depending on, on what treatments they have and in, in what combination. But these are, these are the main, the main steps. Again, this is, this is slightly repeating, Karen, and I, I am sorry, and it's, it's quite a long, busy slide, but in our clinic, we, we see a, you know, a number of people with lots of different issues, and often people have more than one issue, often issues have been more troublesome at different times, 
But, for example, peripheral neuropathy is, is nerve damage um, that can be a, as a consequence of certain types of chemotherapy. I think when you have chemotherapy, you can get nerve, you know, you can experience symptoms of nerve damage, but often, even when you stop chemotherapy, the nerve damage can actually get worse, and it can persist for, for a period of time. Um, I mean, fatigue, I think, um, you know, Karen's talked about that, um, pain, and then, you know, a lot of, a lot of other, you know, quite considerable problems that, that can have, have an impact on, on people's life and, and functioning. <coughs> Again, it, it all interplays that if, you know, if you've got painful feet, you know, it's very difficult to, to go to work, depending on what you do, but, it, you know, it can be very hard to stand up, you know, to, to, to be, you know, active and to perform various functions. That can have financial implications. Um, this is, um, this is a, a kind of semi-fictitious case, but um, quite typical of, of somebody that um, I, see, I see in clinic. <coughs> so this is a lady that had a mastectomy and radiotherapy for breast cancer five years ago. Since the treatment, she's had pain where her scar is. So this is for five years. And also fatigue. And I mean, this is, I mean, just exhaustion, just ab absolute exhaustion. And I think, I, I mean, I, I, like Karen, I think I'm very privileged to, to meet a huge variety of people who explain problems. And, and I kind of, I, you know, having not been through it myself, you, you, can't, you, you can't begin to understand the, you know, how, how much of an impact things have. But, but you can, but I think this lady, was explaining that she just, you know, she was just exhausted all the time. She, you know, it was, it was just, it was quite overwhelming. The pain that she had post mastectomy is is quite a common problem. When you look at case reports, people that have mastectomies, between 20 to 50 percent of them have pain that can can last for a minimum of two years. But this is, you know, often often people feel they're going mad because they're not taken seriously. Because I think I think doctors often can have a it can be really difficult to get their head around the fact that somebody's got pain even when you know they've completed treatment and there's there's no evidence of, of ongoing problems that someone has pain. So I think you know this, this lady they often come to our clinic and they just they've just been dismissed and they just think that they am I going crazy? Um, and it's having the it's also having an impact on, on work and sleep. Um, and I think it's. I think a lot of what we do is is just by explaining that these are real problems. That you know that it, it is a real thing. Someone isn't going mad. It, you know, it's it's a genuine thing, and, and, and trying to help them. I think somebody like her. There's there's obviously barriers to you know to, to her getting getting the appropriate help and, and support. And I was just kind of thinking about this, I was looking at literature, I had a chat to people, and I think a lot of it is, especially in the hospital, often you're seeing unfamiliar people. Um, this is an example, somebody said to me. I think we've all been there, haven't we? And, it's, and I think I can see it from both sides. I think it's great, it's great that you see somebody who's an expert in your condition, you see somebody that's met you before, but I also I also know that you know doctors and nurses we take holidays you know the junior doctors rotate it's it's sometimes not feasible to see the same person all the time but it's not I, it's it's not it's not great is it when you know, you've kind of waited for an appointment for weeks and you've got a lot of things you want to discuss and then you have somebody come in and you think I don't know them they're opening your notes they don't know you it it really it means you're not as free to talk about things um, but it's it's a difficult it's a difficult problem and. Not an easy solution. I think an awareness of it. And, um, I mean, everybody's just so busy, aren't they? And ev everyone's busy. Um, and I know myself that if I if my clinic's running on time and I've got nice long appointments, I'm relaxed and and that you know I think people sense that. But I know that when you've got a waiting room full of people, you you know you're running an hour late. You've got this time pressure and. And that's it's really reflected in your, your interaction with a, with an individual. It's you. I think I think you know, when I when I go to the doctor and you decide you you sense when they're busy and, and you don't want to bother them. You can think, oh my gosh, well I better not better not talk about this. Um, and I think Karen Karen um, Karen put this really nicely. But 
I think that being on the other side, it's, I mean, to sit in a room with someone you don't know very well and talk about incredibly personal things, it's, it's so difficult, isn't it? It really is. And, yeah, and I think, I think if you, I think if you, if you actually tell somebody and you don't get a good response, if, if they're a bit dismissive or look embarrassed, you, it really stops you from ever saying anything again, doesn't it? I think mean, when you've actually been brave enough to talk about it, and if you're not met with, with sympathy and understanding, I think you just think, oh gosh, right, it's, it can just be a, can be difficult, difficult. So, as part of the national, um, about, part of the <coughs> national framework, the Living With and Beyond Cancer, um, it, it just kind of, it just sets out some, some basic, um, guidance really for, for managing consequences of treatment, which includes assessment, different, different treatment strategies, a reassessment. One of the things it talks about is, is it talks about expectations. So, and I think there's, there's been a lot of research and surveys that say people, if they know what to expect, then they're ready for it. The issue with, with side effects of treatment is that there is, I think everybody is given um, leaflets and long consent forms with huge lists of things. I think it's it, I think some things affect individuals more than others, and I, I think you. I think often people just can't take in all the information before they have the treatment. But also, there's some there's something you read the list and you think, well, it might not happen to me, and you know this might not be a problem. So it's it's hard to know what to take seriously and what not to take seriously. And I think as health professionals, it's everything's so individual, and I think we can we can only talk to to people based on our experience and, and what, what the problems are. So what we have started at the Royal Surrey in the last three years is we have a supportive care clinic which stretches to um, people that are living beyond cancer. So I think they're often referred to as cancer survivors. <coughs> um, and these are, it's a tertiary referral clinic, so we are based in the hospital. And we receive referrals from local GPs, from oncologists, from surgeons, um, from dietitians, physios. <laughs> Um, but it's people with, who've, got, who've got symptoms, complex symptoms, who, who really need a, a specialist assessment and um, management plan. I think we, we do try to take, take on board a lot of the barriers to discussing problems. So there's myself and also a clinical nurse specialist. So it's, it's multidisciplinary and you know, we, we involve other, other disciplines if, if necessary. And I think we, um, Jo and I, have worked together for, for a long time. And, I think we know each other's strengths and weaknesses, and I think we, we often, we both see people on the first visit, and then who, who is their key worker and follows them up, depends on, <coughs> on needs, rapport, which, which skill set somebody requires. Um, we try and have longer appointment times, and we try and follow up the same individual as possible, but we do occasionally have um, leave, so sometimes that's not always possible, but it's, it's something we really try and do. And I think like Karen said, um, we have a, an assessment so people can sort of tick what's bothering them before the clinic appointment. Because I think the other thing is people, you come in, don't you, and you've got all these things you want to talk about, and you talk about one thing, and then you're just like, oh, what else was that? So I think it's, it's just so we have a bit of a checklist and we can go through absolutely everything. Um, um, a lot of what we do is to try and diagnose the problem. So I think, I think people that have consequences of treatment for example, if somebody's had chemotherapy or they've had some radiotherapy to their pelvic area and they have long-standing diarrhea, there are there are lots of different possible causes of that. There are lots of there's lots of ways that different treatments can affect the gut, um, and depending on what's causing it depends on how, how you treat it. So it's it's just trying to actually find out what what is causing the problem. It's not it's not just having the problem and then you know giving you a drug for it. Um, though I'm a doctor and I do love to give people drugs, <laughs> but it's it's actually it's actually just just trying to unpick what what is what what is actually happening, and then a management and, and a treatment strategy, and it's it's all done in partnership with the patient. It's explaining what we're doing, why why we're doing it, what what are we treating, and what what are our goals of treatment, and what's realistic, what isn't realistic, and, and, a, and a reasonable follow up plan. Our clinic, the way it operates, with it being in the Royal Surrey, we, we get referrals from, from GPs and also specialist referrals from oncologist, surgeon and, and somebody in the hospital. So normally um, the person that is, is managing the problem, so 
be it follow-up with the oncologist or the surgeon, be it GP, if they're getting a bit stuck and think, actually, we're not quite sure what's going on here, we need a bit more you know, specialist opinion, then they would refer, refer to us <coughs> in the clinic. Thank you. Okay, shall we make a start? Um, otherwise, we won't get lunch, and that's quite important, really, isn't it? Okay. I'd like to introduce Anne Pike, who is the Fountain Centre Manager. I don't know if everybody knows about the Fountain Centre. It's an information and support for those living with cancer, and it has a base at the Royal Surrey. So if any of you have been for treatment at the hospital locally, um, it is um, on the same floor as the outpatients department, and they've also got a little satellite down in radiotherapy as well. Um, and for those of you that may have attended other hospitals, we have got some input also at, on the Ashford Hospital site um, and, and uh, some input also at Friendly Park Hospital as well, but I'm sure that Anne will go through that. Uh, we, are, we are really trying to raise the profile. The Fountain Centre is very integral to the care and support we give to our patients. It's not treatment related at all, it is about support and it is about information. Um, and we would like to make sure that everybody has access and knows about this. We do put information out in our um, appointment letters, but we do find sometimes that people get a bit of a way down treatment, still don't know about it, and they are a valuable resource for us. If, if you know, they deliver different services, but it is it's complementary to what the medical and nursing staff do. Um, so. Um, Anne's got a short presentation, and I'm sure she'll highlight all the services she's got available. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name's Anne, and I'm the manager. We're a very small charity. Um, we're an independent charity, and as Carol said, we sit within um, the Royal Surrey and St Luke's um, Cancer Centre. We've got small outreach services at Frimley Park Hospital and Ashford Hospital, and we're just starting to set up some satellite services um, in the local community. Um, so we have um, a Pilates program in Elstead, um, some massage at a centre in Godalming, and counselling in Guildford. So in its early days at the moment, but we recognise and we realise that one of the issues that people have is they don't want to come back to the hospital after they've finished treatment. Um, parking's a nightmare. Um, and on top of that, actually, you know, they've finished treatment and it's about moving on. So we're recognising that now. We're starting to say, okay, so how do we enable people who have gone through cancer treatment access some of our services more local to them? And so we're starting to work on that. Okay. So what do we do? We've got a load of information, a big library, um, and we hold all the Macmillan information, but we also hold, hold all the information about support groups as well. And if we don't have that information, we can often find it for you. Um, you can pop in and have a cup of tea. Um, it might be that you're waiting for one of your clinic appointments that's running over a bit, or you're waiting to, um, or, you're, or you might be a carer waiting for your husband or your wife to finish their chemotherapy. So pop in and have a cup of tea. There's always someone there, and there's always someone there to have a listening ear as well. We have a range of complementary therapists. These complementary therapists have all been approved by the hospital. And as I say, they're complementary to the treatment that you've had. They're not in addition to. Um, we're not alternative, we're complementary. We've got a big emotional support service um, that includes one-to-one -one counselling. We have a listening service that goes up to the wards. Um, we have a coaching service, which is quite new. And brand new is we have a family support service. So we've got children's counsellor as well. And I'll tell you about more of that later. Um, we have a wig service. So that also is um, the NHS wig service, but we also have our own wig bank, so we can provide wigs um, or hats, um, and we've got a hairdresser on site that can give you advice. So that could be about what happens after your hair starts growing back, you know, who will look after it, do you want to colour it, what are the best products to use, <clears throat> um, or just really maintenance and care for it. Um, the conversations this morning have been about exercise, you know, a lot of push towards making sure people stay active. Um, we have a little bit here at the Fountain Centre. Uh, we run a yoga group and we do a pink ribbon Pilates group, which is a Pilates service for people that have had a breast surgery. Um, but we also have information about exercise groups that are local, so we can refer to Walking for Health or specialist exercise 
practitioners that are skilled in working with people that have had cancer. Um, we heard a lot good feel better, and I think they've got to stand outside. Um, and again, you know, that is a, a lovely service, and we host that <coughs> twice a month. Um, and we also host um, Guildford Citizens Advice, which is their Macmillan side for um, supporting people um, needing advice on financial aspects. Okay, so I've been thinking about this presentation, and I thought the best way to approach it was to look at stuff that we get asked every single day and how we would answer it and how we would go about supporting people to do it. To give you an idea of the diversity of our service, but how we link in with the medical team, but also um, you know, what you can get from us. So one of the big questions is, we're due to go on holiday and celebrate my treatment, or whilst I'm on treatment, I can't get any insurance. Um, it's a big problem. So we have a, a list of um, insurance companies that will um, insure people for travel and on holidays that have had cancer. Um, and this is reviewed regularly, and we ask patients and carers to feed back to us as well about their experiences. And if they're no good, they get swiped off the list. So hopefully that will give you a good starting point if you want to have some information about that. Okay. My hair is growing back, but I'm worried about using high street hairdressers. Okay, so we, as I said, we have a wig service, and this is a skilled hairdresser that runs this wig service. Um, and she can also give you advice on um, how to colour your hair, the first cut after chemotherapy, um, or just really support whilst you're going through treatment. Um, we have got links to other organisations that have hats and scarves, etc. Um, and we can refer to um, local organisations that we know are, are good and they will look after you. Okay, my sick pay is finished, but I'm not ready to return to work. I'm worried about money. We have a wonderful relationship with Macmillan <coughs> CAB, they're not CAB anymore, <coughs> Citizens Advice, um, that are based in Guildford. Um, we are really grateful that they host one of their clinics um, at the Fountain Centre and you can book in to see that. We need to take very little information for you. Um, we do the referral to Macmillan CAB for you. They will process it all. They might contact you and you might be able to deal with it over the phone. And if not, you can have a face-to-face -face appointment with the lovely John. Um, and he comes in once a week. Um, they will take the pressure off. You know, financial difficulties is a massive stress for people, um, especially when they've got other stresses of going through treatment or finishing treatment. Um, and this service enables you to have some support to try and work out um, where to go and where you can access help. Okay, I'm struggling with these hot flushes, but I don't want to take medication. Um, we've heard today about the palliative and supportive care team and you know the support they can give for those symptoms and side effects. You know, but we often get people that say, actually, I'm not, I'm not sure what to do about this. Um, we do have services available um, in terms of complementary therapies, um, and sometimes they're useful and that work for people, and sometimes not. So please feel free to try them. Um, we have acupuncture. We have about seven or eight acupuncturists. And there is some evidence out there to say that it can help and assist with managing your hot flushes. So I would suggest, you know, if it's something that you're, you're okay with having needles in, it might be something worth coming to try, um, coming to try with us. I'm keen to return to gentle exercise, but not sure where to get advice and which one's safe for me. So as I said, you know, we run um, gentle yoga and meditation. Um, Off-site, we run um, a Pilates course for people that are post-operative. Um, and then we have information so we can signpost people to local services that are available, that are they're where they are skilled to look after you and to support you to return to exercise after your treatment. I still get very stressed and worried about needles. We have um, a very big emotional support service and complementary therapy service. And sometimes we will sit with you and try and work out what is right for you. So come into the centre. It could be that we could work with hypnotherapists. Um, we have a number of hypnotherapists that work with people that have got phobias or anxieties about things. Um, we have massage therapists, um, aromatherapy oils, um, Indian head massage, anything to help to relax you to be able to cope with some of the stuff that you're going through. Um, stress and anxiety is a, a big issue and some of our therapists are they're skilled and they're trained to be able to hopefully support you to engage in relaxation techniques. 
I would like to talk to my child, my <coughs> child about my cancer, I'm not sure what words to use. The Fountain Centre has identified this as, a, as has been a problem for a while. Um, and we've been very, very lucky that we've found some funding and we've recruited Julie, who's just down there. Um, Julie's our children's counsellor. Um, she's amazing. She's come with loads and loads of experience and the plan is that she is there to support you to have those conversations. You know, how do you explain to your child what's going on? So she can either work with you as a parent or a grandparent to discuss the best ways to communicate and have those difficult conversations, but she'll also work with your child as well. So she can do some one-to-one -one, um, support or counselling with them. We have a dedicated space now at the Fountain Centre. They don't need to come through the hospital, they can come through our garden um, and she can do some specific work with them. So we're really excited about this and we think already, you know, the referrals of, we're coming, we're getting referrals every single week for her, so we know that it's a popular service. Okay, I'm struggling to relax. Um, as I said, stress and anxiety is, is huge, and we recognize that, you know. And it's not just whilst you're going through your treatment, it's afterwards as well, you know. Those appointments that you have to go to for your follow-up, um, the fears you might have around reoccurrence, you know, the twinges that you might get, and also some of the symptoms that you might get as well. So please, access us. You know, we have complementary therapists. Um, they're all volunteers, so they give their time for free, and they are there and they are dedicated to helping people that are dealing with um, the impact of cancer. So you can book yourself in for acupuncture, massage, Indian head massage, reflexology, Reiki. There's a big, big list of them, um, so please come and use us. As I said, you know, we, we recognize that people don't want to always come back to the hospital, and we're working really hard to try and develop those services outside. So if you want to possibly have something but you don't want to come back to the hospital, it's worth us giving us a call and see if we can find somewhere local that you can access as well. People expect me to go back to the old me, but I'm not that person anymore. I don't know if that rings true as well. Uh, <laughs> um, we have an emotional support team, a really good emotional support team, um, and we recognise that for some people counselling works really well. Um, about helping them to process what's going on. But for some people that have finished their treatment, it's about moving forward. It's about how do I take that next step? How do I move forward? How do I become the new me? And for that, we have something called coaching. Um, these are coaches that have worked in industry that have gone on and they are now called health coaches and medical coaches. They've done additional training. And these people will work with you to actually start processing what's going on, to look at helping you establish goals and to be able to move forward about um, whether that might be about going back to work, returning to exercise, or just having those conversations with people that may have forgotten what you've been through. You know, life moves very fast for people, and these coaches can help support you take those steps on the road to recovery. <coughs> I'm struggling to move forward and process what's happened to me. So I've mentioned our counselling service. We've got a team of about 30 counsellors. Um, they all have additional training in working with people that have cancer. Um, and we don't have a waiting list, and we try not to work with a waiting list, because what's really important to us is when you say to us, we need some help and support, we can be quite responsive and reactive to that. So we appreciate that you know, there is lots of services out there, um, and you may go through your GP, but if you feel that you'd like some counselling because of your cancer diagnosis, then, you know, again, consider us. Unfortunately, that is on site, so you would need to come to the hospital, but it's an option for you. Um, and all you need to do is just ring up to the Fountain Centre and we can um, start the ball rolling. If it's not appropriate, then we make sure that we can actually refer you on or guide you where else you might be able to go to get some help. I'd like to talk to other people that have had cancer but don't know how to access support groups. Um, we don't know about them, we can find out about them for you. Okay, So we've got a resources available that we can find out where there are support groups. Um, and if not, we can often um, work with our existing patients and actually possibly put people together as well. So there's lots of different options. So if you'd like to be able to either access the support groups or talk to anybody else that's been in a similar situation, again, talk to us. 
I don't like coming back to the hospital now that I've finished treatment. Can I access assistance in the community? As I said, we are working on this really hard because we realise that it's really important to support people after they've finished treatment as well as drawing. You know, we currently sit within the acute hospital, which is great, but we need that we need to be able to enable you to access us in the community. So call us and we can see what's available near you. There are also other services, um, not directly locally, but there's one based in Crawley, there's one based at East Surrey Hospital, and there's one based over at Ashford um, that do similar types of things to us. So again, we can sign posters there, that's more appropriate and it's local to you. And that's me, that was a whistle-stop tour of the Fountain Centre. Um, I'm over there and Julie's over there and we'll be over there around lunchtime. So if you have any questions for us or if you'd like any more information about some of the services that we've got, we've got plenty of leaflets, you know, please pop in and, um, and use us. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning ladies and gentlemen. I always get the slot before lunch when you're starting to get hungry. Wait, there's a slot again? Oh no, I'm not quite before lunch, so I'll start the gastric juices going. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I, as Cara said, I'm one of the oncology dietitians that works at St Luke's. I've seen some familiar faces today. Um, what I'm going to talk about really is very much about eating, eating well to feel good. Okay, and actually we're going to focus mainly on healthy eating and the top 10 tips for eating well, which were de devised by Macmillan and the British Dietetic Association, specifically for cancer patients, either before, during or after treatment. I'm going to look a little bit about problems with eating because I'm conscious, and I've already spoken to a couple of people, that it's not all about healthy eating always. And then I'm going to move on to a little bit about taking control, debunking a few myths, and then where to go if you need help. So what are the benefits of eating well? Well, if you have a healthy, balanced diet, you'll be getting all of the nutrients to boost your immune system, which we're all after, specifically, specifically if we're having cancer treatment. It does give you back a sense of control, and I think everybody in this room would say that having a cancer diagnosis and going through cancer treatment, there's nothing that you can control about that. But your diet, you can, so it's very powerful in that way. Um, it improves your health and sense of well-being because you're getting all of the nutrients you need. It gives you good energy levels, but actually, even more important, it reduces the risk of you developing either a new cancer or a recurrence, or actually things like diabetes and heart disease. We know that 30% of cancers are attributable to diet, and actually more specifically to being overweight. Which brings me very nicely onto the first top 10, which may not be appropriate for all of you in the room, but, um, but worth a look. We know that there's strong evidence that keeping a healthy weight reduces your risk of developing a cancer or a recurrence. Now, it's difficult to know exactly why, but they, the, the evidence is showing that it's linked to a balance of hormones in the body. And we know that fat cells can increase the growth hormone, which then can increase your risk of a cancer. You reduce your fat cells, you reduce your growth hormone, you reduce your risk of developing cancer. It's as easy as that. I wish it were putting it into practice though. So what is a healthy weight? Okay, some of you may have seen this. This is a body mass index chart, and I have got two very large ones at my stand. I'm around the corner by the bar. Um, not, not, not near the bar, by the bar. Um, you're aiming, it's a weight to height ratio, and you're aiming for the solid yellow color. You don't want to be anything over. So if anybody wants me to calculate it for them afterwards, I'll be very happy to. I'm there all lunchtime, I'll be here all day, and I won't tell anybody. <laughs> Um, so how do you get towards a healthy weight? Well, if you want to lose weight or you need to lose weight, don't decide you want to lose three stone because that's unachievable and it's just a mountain to climb. Aim for five to, set, five to ten percent um, weight loss at any time. Have your goalposts so that you can get the ball through it. You're going slowly. It's about lifestyle changes. It's not about crash diets. If you crash diet, the weight will come back on again. Just watch your portion sizes, set yourself realistic goals, because it will be achievable. When you achieve it, you'll feel so thrilled for yourself. Um, and pat yourself on the back, and it's small changes. I haven't got a quick fix for this. It's a slow, laborious process. Um, as far as portion sizes are concerned, I've chatted to a couple of people. I've got a portion plate on my stand as well, if you want to come and shock yourselves. We all eat too much. 
And we've become used to eating too much. And actually, the idea is to reduce the, the size of your plate. Listen to your body. Stop when you feel full. If you don't feel over full and you've finished your meal, don't go for seconds. It takes 20 minutes for the, for the message to get to the brain. <coughs> Bulk your meal out with the healthy stuff like vegetables and salads and things. And put leftovers away before you eat. If it's in the fridge, you can't have seconds because it's too much of a palaver to warm it up again. The other thing is, serve the food in the kitchen and don't put it on the table. I am the worst person for roast potatoes. If they're on the table, I will just keep going because they're there. I'm one of those that just keeps going. Um, and if you know that you're going to eat a big dinner, you're going out for dinner, just make sure you're eating less for the rest of the day. And the other thing is just, you know, snacks and things, bits and pieces that you may, might put out for friends. Don't serve the whole lot. Put the rest away in a cupboard that you can't reach, preferably, and then you'd have to get a stall to get at it. It's all psychology, really. So the second tip is about eating regularly. Now, often people think, well, actually, you know, I'm not particularly, I don't like breakfast. Don't skip it. It keeps your energy levels balanced throughout the day. It means that you're not going to get those dips at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you think, oh, do you know, I could, I could just do with a biscuit. Um, so, and, and the other thing is don't skip breakfast because it does provide you with a lot of your daily nutrient needs and it stimulates your metabolism to get going. Um, and you, 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 you start moving. When we go to bed at night, we slow down and you want to speed yourself up at the beginning of the day so that you can actually enjoy the day. The third one I'm not going to labour on because I know David, one of our physios, is coming to talk to you later on this afternoon. Is a, when no, no diet talk is complete without the, the exercise talk and it's about being physically active. It'll help just generally with your energy levels, it boosts fatigue, it, 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 it stimulates your immune system. Um, and it does help you feel good. But by exercise, um, I'm not talking about going to the gym. A walk around the block is, is, is good enough, but David will talk more about that. So now we're getting to the nitty gritty about what to eat and more importantly, what not to eat. It does sound like I'm going to be telling you a lot of things not to eat, so bear with me and forgive me, please. Um, Eat more vegetables, eat more fruit. They're full of nutrients. They're full of, of uh, things called antioxidants, which help reduce the chemicals in the body. They are full of fiber, which helps our bowel be healthy um, and allows us to be able to go to the loo more frequently. Um, they're low in energy, so if you're watching how much you eat, there's less energy, less calories in fruit and vegetables. They also taste yummy. They're low in fat. And we aim for five, up to five portions a day. So start with some fruit on your cereal in the morning. Have a piece of fruit mid-morning, salad in your sandwich at lunchtime, two portions of veg in the evening, and you're done. You've got your five portions. Um, eat a variety of colours. No one fruit or vegetable is any better than any other, um, contrary to popular belief. The green ones all have the same vitamins and minerals in, the orange ones do as well. So have a wide variety of colours during the course of the day or the week. Um, and try to eat the whole fruits and vegetables rather than juices because you're going to lose out on the fibre if you don't. Um, and, and we try to limit juice to perhaps <coughs> one glass a day. The other thing to eat more of are whole grains and pulses. Now, whole grains are the rice, pasta, potatoes, just making sure that you're going for the brown and the wholemeal varieties as much as possible. The pulses are lentils, chickpeas, beans. Very, very good for you. They're good alternatives to meat, um, to meat products as well, and which I'm coming on to in a moment. Very rich in fiber. They are um, low in fat and energy, depending obviously on how you cook them, so you don't want to add too much oil when you're cooking to things, or butter. Um, try to include something of these in each meal. They're very important, they give us fuel. You can't start a car without petrol, and this is our petrol. Um, three servings daily, thereabouts, and you can, if you're not really keen on lentils and beans and things, or you don't want a whole plateful, add them to other dishes. Um, because then what you can do is add a spoonful, say, of red lentils to a soup. They cook through nicely. You barely know they're there, but you've really enriched with protein and fiber. Okay, now I move on to the avoid bit. This is where you all sit back and go, oh, God, here we go. Okay, so we'll start with the sugary drinks. Um, they are linked to weight gain. They convert to fat in the body. It goes around our middles, and that's the thing that we need to avoid. And
and it has, it has been proven, um, the World Cancer Research Fund has said that, that it is, is linked to, to increased incidence of breast cancer particularly. So if we're looking at the fizzy drinks, uh, squashes that are no added, you know, they're not the no added sugar ones, so the full sugar squashes, and also natural fruit juices, which again, I said one glass a day, there is a lot of sugar in there. It is better for you than a fizzy drink, but again, limit to one glass a day. Instead, swap water, tea, coffee, herbal teas, no added, no added um, sugar squashes. The other thing I haven't put on there is things like skimmed milk. Very good for you if you like a glass of milk and not hugely calorific. Um, the other thing to avoid are processed foods. These are the ones that are all the nice, nice tasting ones. So we always get a bad name because we're always telling you to stop eating the things that taste the best. Um, the donuts, the biscuits, the cakes, the pastries, you know, all of those really nice Moorish things. It's trying to avoid them as much as possible. Don't kick yourself if you have the odd splurge. Just get back on track afterwards. Okay, so then we're talking about red meat. Now, I'm often asked this in clinic about, well, should I be cutting out red meat? We say limit it. It's, it has been linked to a higher incidence of bowel cancer, but large amounts. And I think it's really, it, it is important to have maybe a small amount of it because it's part of a healthy, balanced diet. There's lots of iron and zinc and minerals in red meat, but it's going for the low-fat varieties and making sure that you're not overdoing it and that you're maybe having it a couple of times a week. Um, instead, chicken and fish will provide you with the protein that you need as well. So, so that would be a better choice more often than not. Okay, I'm back to avoid. Processed meat. This one used to be limit, it's now avoid. It's categorically been linked to an increased risk of bowel cancer. Now, I know that many of you in here haven't had a bowel cancer, but what you don't want is a second cancer, and, uh, or you don't want a recurrence of a bowel cancer. It's all of the ham, bacon, salami, all those hot dogs, processed foods. They have been linked, and so it's, it's, it's really best to avoid them altogether and have other things instead. So if you normally have ham in a sandwich, then maybe have some sliced chicken instead. Much better for you, or maybe a tin of tuna or something like that. Okay, so now move on to fats. This is where you're going to really grow. So we are looking at avoiding high-fat diets. So limiting the fat in your diet. You want, don't want to end up with heart problems as well. High fat is, is linked to, high, uh, to, to um, heart disease and uh, type 2 diabetes as well. Again, a diet high in fat is going to lead to weight gain. So it's best limiting as many fats as you possibly can and eating the plant-based varieties. It's an, it's an, when you go to the supermarket, you look at those shelves and you think, well, what on earth should I be having? There are so many options. Do you find that? It's like, well, which oil? Which spread? Essentially, you want the, the vegetable-based ones. So an olive-based spread or olive oil or a <coughs> vegetable oil or a vegetable-based spread or sunflower spread and be sparing with it because there are as many calories in some sunflower spread as there is in butter. So don't be fooled by thinking, oh, well, I'm, I, I can have as much as I like because it's not butter. Same calories, same energy. Um, we do try and um, um, suggest uh, oily fish. So your oily fish is your tuna, um, tuna, salmon, uh, mackerel, kippers, sardines, all of those. Try and have two portions a week so you can have those instead of maybe your, your red meat um, as part of a balanced diet. Now this is where you're going to grow. Opt for low fat dairy products. So, so skimmed milk or 1% milk, which is now sold widely in the supermarkets, or semi-skimmed milk rather than the full fat. But it's limiting high-fat foods, and one of those high-fat foods is cheese. Now, I love cheese. And, the, and I can hear there's people in the room that also like cheese, yes. Now, the recommendation, um, and I'm, I'm really nervous about saying this because you might not want to listen to anything else, is about is, is, is one to two portions a week. A portion is a matchbox size. <coughs> not a big matchbox size, a little matchbox size. Okay, it's not a lot. So if you're going to have cheese, we tend to say we'll grate it into a sandwich if you're going to have cheese, because you'll end up with less in that sandwich, but it'll look like more because you've grated it. Don't do what I do, where if I'm using cheese, one slice goes in my mouth and one slice goes in the dinner. 
very easy to do. So just be, a, just be aware of that. Um, and again, the biscuits, the cakes, the pastries, the pies, all of those good things. Not really very well, isn't it? No, no, I'm not going to do very well at this at all. Now, moving on. Limit salt and salty foods. Now, um, the, it, there is an increased risk of stomach cancer with a high salt diet and also high blood pressure. We know that if you can reduce the salt in your diet and you have a healthy, balanced diet, a lot of people have come off blood pressure medi medication. Now, 26 million people in the UK eat too much salt, and the recommendation is six grams a day. Now, six grams a day is a level teaspoon of salt. Three quarters of that level teaspoon comes from foods already that we're eating. So it's not a lot. Now, don't go cold turkey because everything is going to taste really bland and awful. So what we tend to suggest is start slowly, bear with it, your palate will adjust, I promise you. Um, it's stopping using salt at, at the table first and foremost, then reducing how much you add to cooking. Everything you go and eat out in a restaurant is going to taste super salty because they, they all add things in, in restaurants. But at least if most of the time at home you've reduced your salt, um, you will reduce your risk of, of uh, high blood pressure. Please don't use low salt alternatives. Re retrain your palate. The low salt alternatives contain potassium and can be dangerous. Um, they shouldn't be sold, in my opinion, um, at all, but please don't use those. Um, and use other things to flavour your food, you know, a squeeze of lemon juice or extra herbs and spices, um, things like that, mustard as well. A really good way of flavouring your food instead of salt. Okay, now some of you have come and taken my little alcohol cups on my stand. Um, any alcohol at all is linked to an increased risk of cancer. Now the recommendations have recently been changed. So for the men amongst you, it's now two units a day maximum. It used to be three to four. Um, and two units a day is not, is not very much, you will see. A pint of beer is 2.3 units, so if you go to the pub and have a pint of beer, you've overdone it already. We encourage people to have several days a week without alcohol, but don't do all your 14 units on one night at the weekend, <laughs> please. You will feel it the next morning. Um, they are empty calories. We absorb alcohol from our stomachs, and we don't do anything with it. They are completely empty and they can lead to weight gain. So it's just a gentle, gentle reminder, should I say. There is a website on there that is very useful. There's an app, if you've got a smartphone, that you can log how much you're drinking. I thought I was drinking within my limits, and I logged what I, and, I, and I'm not a big drinker, and I have several days free a week, and I was doing double what I thought I was. And it was very, it, I, I used this earlier with somebody, it was a very sobering thought, pardon the pun, I don't mean that, but you know what I mean. <coughs> so our last top tip is about supplements. I'm often asked about vitamin and mineral supplements in clinic, um, and by people wanting to know what should I be taking. In essence, if you're managing a healthy, balanced diet, you, you, you shouldn't need them. The majority of people who take vitamin and mineral supplements don't actually need them, and they're very expensive. You aim for getting your nutrients from your food, from a healthy, balanced diet. Too much of a good thing can be dangerous. So please be aware, and we try, we say to people during treatment, please don't have any at all, because we just don't know the interaction with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and we just want you to be safe during treatment. Sometimes they're appropriate. If you're low in vitamin D, or you've got osteoporosis and needing calcium supplementation, or if you've got anemia, and need iron tablets. So there, there, are, there are times that you, you should be taking them, but be advised by your doctor or your dietitian. So just a little word about eating out. Um, eating out is, is hard. Somebody said to me earlier, you know, I'm fine at home, but it's when I go out. There are little tips to use. So if you're, having, if you're going to buy a sandwich, make sure that you're going for the lower calorie options. Avoid the mayonnaise. I know the ones with mayonnaise taste nicer. There's a reason for that. Um, tomato, not cream-based sauces in, in restaurants. Pasta dishes with cream-based sauces, for example, um, have a lot more energy and, 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 and fat than a tomato-based sauce. Dressing always on the side. Restaurants are very good at ch chucking a load of dressing on salads, um, and sometimes too much. So if you ask for it on the side, you can be in control of that. Plain rice, not fried. And the best tip is order your meal first if you're with a group of friends, because you can order a healthy meal, 
Because if you, it, I know I'm bad. If I'm sitting there and everybody else is ordering these yummy things and you're hungry, you'll end up with the lasagna over the salad. So order first because then you can't change your mind. So I just want to show you this. I've got one on the stand. This is the very brand new pictorial representation of a healthy balanced diet from the government. If you search for Eat Well Guide online, you'll be able to find it and you can download a copy. It basically shows that the green part and the yellow part are mostly veg vegetable sources, your fruits and veg and your, um, your pasta, rice, potatoes, all of those. You've got the pink section, which is all of your protein foods, your meat, your fish, your eggs, um, beans, lentils, all of those. Then your dairy, dairy and dairy alternatives, very important as part of a healthy, balanced diet. Now what they've done is they've reduced the naughty segment down to oils and spreads here, the purple one. You, we do need a little bit of that. But all of the cakes and pastries and chocolates have been removed from the plate of a healthy, balanced diet. So it's really trying to avoid those as much as you can. You've also got six to eight glasses of fluid a day, which is important. And you can, you can check whether you're doing okay on the products that you buy in the supermarket with the traffic light system, and it's on most products in the supermarket now. You can't do this on a daily basis, not possible. But think of your diet over the course of a week or two to make sure that you're actually getting appropriate amounts of each different food group. So, taking control, I talked about this in the beginning. Changing your diet is really hard. You need to go slowly. You need to have kind of coping mechanisms, I think, often. Some people find if, they're, if you're wanting to lose weight, you need to really focus. It's, write a food diary. Keep a food diary. If you write it down, you'll eat less, I can promise you. Decide on what you're going to do and be realistic about your goals. Don't say, I'm going to lose two stone in two months, because it, it, it's hard. Don't get down about how far you've got to go. Think about how far you've come. Think about how well you're doing. Just spin it on a positive. Um, I'm the world's biggest optimist. So, you know, it's the best way to be. Remember all the reasons why you wanted to change your diet, all of those risks and, and the fact that you'll be healthier and leaner and fitter. Um, there is a 90% rule. You can't be good 100% of the time. So just allow yourself that 10% every now and again and don't feel bad about it. Okay. And also, do it with somebody else. This is for the whole family, <laughs> including the grandchildren. They don't need cake when they come round which is something that's often, oh, I keep it in the house for the grandchildren. No, they don't need it. <laughs> okay, so I did promise you that I would cover a little bit about if you have problems eating, because what I have just talked about, the top 10 tips, applies to most of us, but every now and again, and it can change during your cancer journey, that you might actually have more problems with your food, that you might have side, side effects and symptoms that are impacting on your diet, which is a lot of the work that I do at, at St. Luke's. Go for little and often. Throw the rule book out of the window. So everything I've just said to you doesn't apply if you are struggling. Because if you continue to lose weight or, you, or you, um, you're really struggling to eat, then if you eat a healthy, balanced diet or try and eat a healthy, balanced diet, you're going to continue to lose weight and you'll be poorly. So it's about drinking more, more, more nourishing fluids, so milky drinks, um, milkshakes, all of these lovely things that actually... I, I, sh I mustn't do. So I spend my life being hungry um, in my clinics. Fortify your meals. Grate some cheese into your soup. You, it'd be very, very easy for me to say, well, you're not eating very much, so you've got to have a big plate full of soup. And I know what people will do. They'd look at me and go, I can't do that. It's too much. If you grate a little bit of cheese into your soup, you've got a big bowl of soup, but in a little bowl of soup because you've added, you've fortified it. And I have, if anybody is struggling, I've got some literature on the stand, come and see me and we can have a chat. Um, it's also about more snacks and regular puddings. So you see, I've gone back on what I just said. This is, this is why I could be here all day, because there's so <laughs> much to talk about. Um, if you're still losing weight, and there are many reasons why people continue to lose weight, either during or after cancer treatment, you may have difficulty swallowing still, um, you might be at risk of an obstruction, so food's not going down very well. You maybe have a tube feed. Um, you might have, um, and I know Kath mentioned it this morning, about um, side effects from radiotherapy that are impacting on your, on your diet because your bowel symptoms are so awful. 
There's lots of different things. People have irritable bowel syndrome that can affect how much they eat. Please seek help. I think this has been the biggest message this morning, is if you've got an issue, don't, it's, don't think, well, this is what I've got to cope with. Because mostly, as far as diet is concerned, we can help with something. And we're very good at holding up our hands if we can't. So I just want to quickly move on. I'm conscious of the time. Um, a little word of caution. One of the challenges of being a dietitian um, in a cancer centre is that we have the internet now. And the internet, um, anybody can post on the internet, anybody at all, um, and they don't need to be qualified to do so. Anybody can publish a book if the publisher thinks that it's going to sell. And so as a result, there are lots of dietary websites and books out there that might not actually be safe for you to follow. So please bear with them. The theory is very compelling. Often in practice, it's very hard to do, and it could be dangerous to your overall care and treatment. So just be wary of what you're going for, okay? Um, I, sorry, press the button on the so, I want to debunk some can cancer myths before I go. Superfoods boost immunity. Superfoods don't really exist. They still talk about them. But like I said, you know, a goji berry is a purple thing. It's the same as a blackberry. It has the same properties. It's going to do the same thing. Pomegranate is red. Red, raspberries, strawberries, all of those things have the same properties. Actually, what boosts your immunity is a healthy, balanced diet. Organic foods contain more nutrients than non-organic foods. They don't. They contain exactly the same nutrients. They're just grown in a different way. They're not dangerous, the non-organic foods. We wouldn't be able to sell them in the supermarket. But if you decide that you want to go organic, that's absolutely fine. But you will all be getting the same nutrients. Alternative diets can cure cancer. If they could, nobody would be going through treatment at St. Luke's. And I would be a wealthy woman because I would be the one in charge. And unfortunately, I'm not. Um, sugar feeds cancer. Yes, it does. Sugar does feed cancer, but it also feeds every other cell in your body, including your blood cells and your muscle cells and your brain cells. So removing all sugar from your diet, and yes, we're talking about fizzy drinks and sugary foods, but sugar is formed from all of those whole grains as well. It is not necessary to remove them, okay? Dairy foods need to be excluded. We've really not got any evidence to support this, and they do provide us with a really good source of protein and calcium and vitamins. Um, if you are concerned, some people are like, I'm just not sure, I don't, I don't want to do it, then yes, there are lots of alternative dairy foods out there. Just make sure that you're buying milks with forti fortified with calcium so that you're still getting the calcium for strong bones. Because the last thing we need is for you to end up with osteoporosis or fractures or anything like that. Um, so just be wary. I wish this were true, red wine protects against cancer. <laughs> but it isn't. <laughs> I don't think I'm the same about that. And juicing increases vitamin and mineral intake. It doesn't. It's the same as eating a whole fruit. And for all the reasons I said to you before, the whole fruits are better. More fibre, better bowel function. So finally, I'm finished nearly. Just to recap, it's about eating regular meals. It's about making sure you've got five portions of fruit and veg on most days. Um, plenty of whole grains and pulses. Swap your red meat for fish and vegetarian sauces. Reduce your fat, reduce your sugar, reduce your salt, reduce your alcohol. <coughs> Watch your portion sizes and try and aim for a healthy weight. If you have problems, then please ask for help. And if you want to look at um, information online, the Macmillan website is excellent. Cancer Research also has some very good, um, good things. The British Dietetic Association website and NHS Choices are all really good places to go to for really balanced, evidenced advice. That's me done. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Chris Todd, and I'm a carer advisor at Carer Support Guildford, and I'm going to be talking later on, um, at the end, not much later on, um, about my two days a week at the Royal Surrey County Hospital. Who is a carer? Well, I've been working with carers now for 16 years, Firstly, with mental health carers, um, I did um, eight years working with families who had somebody in their family suffering from mental health problems. And in the last six years, I've been working at Carer Support Guildford, where we support all carers. 
But the one thing I have learnt over the 16 years, and the many people that have sat in my office or sat in front of me, have not known that they are a carer. Because they say to me, but that's my husband. You know, I'm, I'm not a carer. A carer are people who you pay to come in and, and look after people. That's my mother, that's my father, that's my son, that's my daughter. Actually, that's my neighbour. I help my neighbour. I'm not my neighbour's carer, but I do their shopping, their washing, and I do cook a few meals a day. So as you can see by the images here, a carer is somebody who cares, unpaid, for a family, a friend, member, who due to illness or disability, mental health problem or an addiction, can't cope without that carer's support. And anybody can become a carer. You saw an image there of, of a, a child. In Surrey, um, we have uh, Surrey Young Carers, an organisation that supports children who are carers. And it might be that that child is just living in a family where there's a serious illness. The child might not be, in our eyes, providing practical care, but perhaps their life is disrupted for a little while, and Surrey Young Carers can help there by supporting them. So, okay, I'm a carer. Well, where do I get support? How do I go about this? Well, in Surrey, I do apologise for those of you who live outside Surrey, we have a, a, a really good system with all GPs in Surrey have a carer's register. And anybody who is providing an ama any amount of care to somebody can actually register at their GP as a carer. So well, what benefits does that give me then? Okay, if you're a carer and you're looking after somebody, you know, you, you might be doing a certain amount of physical care. Suddenly you're appearing at the GPs with a little bit of backache. And the GP can look immediately and see that you're a carer, because it, you're registered there. And he can offer you, she can offer you, extra support. And also, what we've done in Surrey is each GP in the Surrey area can do what we call a carer's prescription and he can refer you as a carer to other services. He can refer you directly to Guildford Carer Support and many other services but also any carer support service in Surrey. And here we are. In Surrey we have a carer support service in every borough. What do we do? What do we do at Guildford Carer Support? Well, we can provide information on services to support you in your caring role. I spend a lot of my life filling in benefit forms because they're such a pain. You know, when you, you know, and, and what benefit? What benefits are there out there for carers? I'm out at my stand there lunchtime and I have a whole, a whole load of um, a booklets about benefits for carers. Um, since I've been working at the Royal Surrey, I've been going out to visit carers and I think, just for an example, say out of ten carers I visited at home, eight of them who are elderly know nothing about attendance allowance. Um, so there's lots of benefits out there for carers and the cared for <coughs> children that people sometimes are not aware of. So. Oh, the other thing we offer is advocacy and support in attaining services. Um, professionals are brilliant. I work at the Royal Surrey. I, I am so supported. And I'm sure you can all say that support that you have had has been brilliant. Just now and again, when you're trying to get hold of somebody, you can play an answering machine game. You want to speak to somebody, that person doesn't get back to you. And it could be that you, um, you might be expecting some kind of care to come into your home. We will advocate on your behalf. You can come to us and say, you know, um, I'm really having trouble um, talking to the Department of, 
public health or the depart sorry, the Department of Works and Pensions, you know, the benefits people. You know, can you can you can you help me with this? We will do that. Um, the other thing that we do is I've attended prior to me working at the Royal Surrey, I at Guildford Carers Support, I was in charge of parent carers. So I took care of parents who had children with disabilities and illnesses. I've attended a lot of school meetings. Lots of school meetings I've gone along with. <coughs> because just sometimes, when you are in a room with a lot of professionals, sometimes uh, talking about your child or talking about anything, it can be quite intimidating. So we will go um, and support you with advocacy. The other thing we support is at tribunals, when people's benefits are sometimes... Um, refused if we feel there is a real you know and, and you really do deserve, deserve that benefit we will help you um, we will help you fight that case and we will go along to a tribunal with you but mostly one of the things we do is we we've got a listening ear and um, you know for many of you here I know the person that you love and care for is going through a difficult time and has gone through. But sometimes you might need to talk to somebody just about how you're feeling. And I know that we've talked about the wonderful counselling service um, that we have at the Fountain Centre. But also, you know, you can just talk to us as well. That's a big part of what we do when we come out to help you fill in forms and to do other things. The other thing that we do is people do recover. People can get over serious illness and, and can get back <coughs> to a normal life. And for some people who are carers, they might have been looking after somebody for a long time. Now, sometimes it's because, sadly, that <coughs> maybe elderly mother or father or husband or wife has passed away. And actually, you know, I've been out of the workplace for 10 years. What do I do? I've been caring for my husband, and I've still got friends, but they're used to me saying I can't come out because, you know, I can't leave him. <laughs> so we actually do have a group, and we support carers um, after their caring role has finished. One of the groups we've recently um, started in the last two years is a friendship group. And this is a group for former carers. And it's, it's really taken off well. And former carers can socialise together. They plan their trips. They go out to the theatre. They do all sorts of things. And it reintegrates carers back into a social life. We send out a newsletter. And in that newsletter, we send out lots of information um, from, <coughs> from all over, anything that might be relevant to yourself as a carer and the person you care for, you will receive that in a newsletter. Um, and it tells you about the things that we do, because we do nice things as well, apart from coming out and filling horrible old benefit forms. We, we do time-out trips and information days and pamper days for carers. This is what we're going on at the moment. Next week, I'm, you will see me Sunday baking. I'm going to be making some lemon drizzle cake because we're doing a day in the country. And um, that's uh, what's going to be happening there. Flying, fishing for men. Dementia information days, end of life care. The last one, power of attorney, wills and trust. It's a day that's very, very popular for us, we run it every year, and um, it's a really, a really well attended day that we do. Coming up in June, in June is Carers Week. Carers Support Guildford will be doing a float away on the canal, and the mental health support group will be doing an evening in St Pius Church Hall. And the Royal Surrey will be doing a stand for Carers Week down in the staff canteen. These
these are the regular carer support groups that we run. Now earlier on I showed you a map of Surrey. Although Carer Support Guildford is an individual charity, all the carer support groups, we're all individual charities throughout Surrey, but we all do the same sort of thing. So if you live in Elmbridge, Tandridge or Rygate, places like that, you will find that your local carer support group will be running information days and um, carers groups, support groups. So one of the most exciting things for me in the past year, since last September, is that I've been seconded to the Royal Surrey. Now part of that is working in partnership with the CCG. Um, some of you may or may not have heard of the Poyle Charity gave Guildford Carers Support a grant to put me in the to put me in the Royal Surrey. Sorry, and um, I work at the Royal Surrey two days a week. And one of the things is to actually um, <coughs> we we actually have come up with a CCG and Surrey County Council have come up with a care prescription for the Royal Surrey. And the Royal Surrey is the first hospital in the country to do this. So this prescription allows health staff to support care as they come into contact with by referring them to a range of services. The support can be provided to the carer directly or to the person being cared for. Because sometimes the carer says, well, I don't need help. It's for my husband or for my wife. And we can signpost you to get <coughs> the correct help for them. And at the Royal Surrey, by a staff member filling in this carer's prescription, um, it can get a lot of carer's help that they didn't even know about. Now, I know many of you have been into the hospital. You know how busy they are. Everybody is really busy. So when this carer prescription was put together, and it took a long, long time, um, it had to be that a member of staff could do it quickly. Because you know how busy the nurses are, the doctors, the occupational therapists and the physiotherapists. It takes one minute, 15 seconds to complete this prescription. They can click a switch, it's gone, and that carer is then eligible for the services that they've referred them to. So we're very proud of it, and I will, I, I will be delighted to talk to you about it outside there. These are some of the services that can be, uh, carers can be referred to through the prescription. So a direct referral to the social care um, for a carer's needs assessment for a carer. If you don't want somebody sort of coming to see you, just want information, an information pack can be sent out. A carer's emergency card, which I will show you in a minute. And of course, a carer's support organisation. So wherever you are across Surrey, these organisations provide information. What I will say, that with this prescription, if you are living outside of the Surrey area, it is still available for you. We still do prescriptions for people in Hampshire and other areas. The organisation <coughs> that is the gatekeepers of this prescription is SILK. Surrey Independent Living Council, and they will then um, resource a carer's support service in an area. Worcester, because we have carers who live in Worcester, who are caring or are concerned about somebody who lives in Guildford, so we will do those referrals and get them support they need in the area. But Silk will. This is um, an emergency card. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Have you seen it? Carer's emergency card? You can see it around the hospital in the doctor's surgery. It's an emergency card in Surrey that registers you with Surrey County Council. But if anything was to happen to you in your caring role, you know, if you were out and you were twisted your ankle or something happened to you, and you were caring for somebody at home, 
Surrey County Council will put three days free emergency service in, but you have to register. And um, I've been out to see people in the Guildford area, and they've been very proud to show me, I've got the emergency card, I'm carrying it, Chris. Have you registered, I say? Oh, well, I've filled it in. But of course, if somebody's going to look after your loved one at home, they'll need to know how they get into the house, what medication they're taking, where the medication is. More importantly, how the person you love and care for wants to be looked after for those three days. So it is important that if you do pick one of these, please make the phone call and register. Now I've missed a very important slide here. And I've got to try and find it. Oh no, here it is. I thought I'd missed it. So, carers breaks. Silk, I've already mentioned, is the Surrey Independent Living Council. And again, they're the gatekeepers of lots of services throughout the, um, in Surrey. Now, carers are eligible for breaks. And you can obtain that in, in a few ways. I'm going to home in on two of the most important ones. Firstly, through your GP. There are two pots of money. One from social care, which is Surrey County Council, and one from health. Your GP is the one from health. And this is to help carers maintain their health and well-being. It's to allow you to carry on caring for somebody without you becoming um, too stressed and having care strain and not perhaps being able to take time out from your caring role. But it is also to help you, um, it, it could do things for you practically that help you carry on your caring role. Come on to that and give you an example in a minute. You can also get a carer's break from carer's advisor like myself. But this is different, this comes from social care. And unfortunately, not fortunately, unfortunately, if you are receiving a package of care from social services, if carers are coming into your home, then you can't have it from us. But you can still have it from the GP. And if anybody is confused by this, please, I will, I will <coughs> talk to you and I will give you the leaflet outside. So, GP, health money, from us, it comes through social care. So what can you get with this carer's break money? Uh, you know, my <coughs> husband and I, we're a pair. I like looking after him, you know. It's, it's not a hardship, so what can we do? Well, I'll give you an example of last week I went out to see a couple. They were an elderly couple, but um, very proud. <coughs> the gentleman was quite poorly and immobile, um, but his wife, was adamant she wanted to do all the care. They had family, a very, very supportive family that helped. They allowed me to do some referrals. They allowed me to um, get them attendance allowance. And when I spoke about this money, oh, we couldn't accept any money. I said, well, what, what, isn't there something that will help you in what you do? I said, how about, how about having a little bit of cleaning, having some help with the cleaning? Oh, no, 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 I couldn't possibly. I like to do my own cleaning. And luckily, her daughter was there, and she says, but Mum, that hoover is so heavy. So what do you think they're going to use the money for? They're going to buy one of those lovely light hoovers so this elderly lady can take it up and downstairs. We've used this money, or carers have used this money, to actually um, buy a washing machine because, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Caring, as already mentioned, and illness can, can make finances, your finances, quite vulnerable. So, you know, when something big happens, like a washing machine breaks down, you need that washing machine, you know, to carry on. So, that is something that um, the money can be used for. A computer, so that people who are isolated can do internet shopping and keep in touch with other people. There are lots of ways, and I've got leaflets out there that will explain how, how you can use that money. Um, obviously, 
the main thing is to use it for a break so that the carer can have a break away. It could be for both of you because a carer will still go for get a rest if you're going away and having your meals cooked and staying in a nice hotel for a weekend. That is a real break for both of you. Action for carers, Surrey, Surrey Young Carers, Learning and Works, and Back Care, all come under the umbrella of, of Action for Carers, and they're all services that are there for carers. Perhaps one of the biggest that's already mentioned um, earlier on is, you know, now my, you know, my caring role is over, I've been doing this, how do I go back to work? Action for Carers um, Learning and Works is a fantastic organisation that will help you um, look at how to do a CV if you've been out of work for 10 to 15 years. And can they run courses on confidence building? And they can help look at education courses for you that will enhance your life if you want to um, do something different. So that's me finished. I know you must have lots of questions. I'll be delighted to speak to you out there on the stand, and I do have the leaflets on the silk paper. <coughs> I must apologise again and say I'm sorry that Surrey is the only area that does carers' payment. I'm really pleased, I'm very grateful to these two gentlemen here for coming to talk to us and giving a, a, a patient perspective on all of this and hopefully they'll have some useful tips for you. So we're going to start off with um, Sam, okay, so who's one of our patients and um, he has been working with us uh, uh, looking at health and well-being for what we call young adults, which is the 19 to 24 group. And we have been running some <laughs> well-being events for them. Um, in exciting places like Frankie and Benny's and the Swarp Park, because we take a slightly different approach for that age group. So anyway, we'll welcome Sam on the floor. I think he's got about 10 minutes to yeah. go through his thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Hi, guys. Hi. Oh, well, that's good. But it's the first time. I was going to say, I can't hear you, but I can't hear you. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me to come and talk to you. Um, I've had cancer. Uh, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2010, um, and I battled through the, through the, through the cancer, uh, got rid of it, um, and it came back. Um, and then after that, I had uh, some more chemotherapy, radiotherapy as we go along, um, and I finish uh, with a transplant. I am an extreme um, version of, of, of cancer treatment, um, so I don't want anybody to get stressed or worried about anything that I say today. Um, it, it is quite rare to have something like that. Um, I'll tell you a few different side effects that I've had as well, but I really don't want to scare anybody, so just don't, don't uh, worry, this, this is very rare. Um, unfortunately, I had a few complications from my cancer treatment. Um, I had something called a vascular necrosis, uh, which is to do with your bones, um, and I've had a few other, uh, other issues, um, but that's all a bit grim, we don't want to talk about that. Um, today, I've come to talk to you a little bit about um, support network. Um, people that supported me when I was in my treatment um, and the people you can try and look to uh, in your treatment. Um, there's lots of people when you, when, when you get diagnosed that don't know maybe what to say, how to approach you, um, they, they get a bit off with it. I'm sure you've all experienced that with friends, maybe family even, uh, who, who will come up to you and say, oh you're looking well, or, how are you today, or, you look well, um, and you're like, well, yeah, I'm not really. Uh, I don't feel, feel, feel as well as you, that you say that I look, um, which is really annoying, yeah? Has anybody experienced that? Yeah? And yeah, you just want to tell them to shut up, get them off. Um, but you can't, obviously, you have to be very polite. Um, and I'm sure you all are lovely and polite. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start off by um, telling you who supported me through my treatment. Um, my main people that supported me were obviously my mum and dad. Um, I had treatment up at the Royal Marsden Hospital, I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Um, and what happened was when I was staying in the hospital, my mum would stay in the day, then my dad would take the night or they would swap over. Um, so I was never without somebody, but obviously at a younger age that's more important. I was 16 when I was diagnosed. Um, so it's, it's more important to have your parents around. Um, I couldn't have done it without them, um, so uh, they, were, they were vital to me. Um, just, just to have them there, I, I think it felt um, more 
more well, safe, do you know what I mean? It's a yeah. feeling of safety, yeah? Um, I don't know if anybody, obviously, few people, parents still uh, around um, in the audience today. I'm speaking to a slightly different audience to that of what I'm used to. <laughs> no offence to anybody. Any audience, any audience. <laughs> I've got to get out of here alive, so no offence, yeah? Um, I don't mean any, any offence to anyone. Um, obviously, the second um, lot of people that supported me uh, were my sisters. I have two sisters. I'm the middle child. There was the problem child, apparently. Yes. yes. I don't know what that's all about. I've never been a problem. Um, so yeah, the problem, problem child, middle child. Um, but I have an older sister, and uh, my uh, younger sister is much younger. And she's uh, just finishing secondary school. She's near ten at the moment. Uh, so she's fourteen. So it's all about makeup and how you look and this and that and the other. She's a bit of a nightmare, but I won't tell her because she'll just shout at me. Um, I've got an older sister uh, who is just finishing her PGC, uh, which is a teacher training group degree. Um, so she's coming back home soon. She's been in Wales for three years. I don't want her to come back home, but don't mind. <laughs> These things just happen, don't they? Um, but she's coming home to live back at home with us, which will be interesting, because um, she's lived on her own for a good couple of years. Uh, but the two, my two sisters were so supportive of me the whole way through. Um, they were there for me. Uh, I've got a picture of, of my uh, youngest sister. She was eight when I was diagnosed. Um, so it's very difficult. You don't know whether to tell or not. Uh, but we did, and, and I think it was the right thing to do because she could be there for me and she understood. Um, and what she did was, in this picture, she, you can see her in the hospital feeding me uh, and giving me some food and stuff and looking after me. So she was crucial. Um, my older sister, who I just had a go at, but um, she, she was amazing too. Um, she actually came back from her degree uh, and missed a year to, to uh, look after my younger sister. Um, she acted as mum for at least a year, uh, if not longer, um, because I um, needed help from my mum and dad. And I mean, when they went home from looking after me, they were quite tired, so um, they didn't really have a lot of time for her. Uh, so I can't thank the two of them enough. Um, so siblings is a really good one, if, if you've got a sibling. Just have a chat to them about it. They might not know what to say straight away, um, and they might be a bit off with you. But if you go to them, you approach them, and you, you, you tell them how you're feeling, um, I'm sure they're feeling just as, as scared and as, and as worried about it as probably you are. Um, and they could be a really, really good support. So um, siblings is a crucial one. Um, the next one is friends. It's slightly different for me. Uh, I, was, I was at college when I was diagnosed. Um, and one difficulty with being in education is it doesn't stop for, for everybody else. Um, so when you're ha having your, I, I was in having my treatment, they were all moving on to, to university and, and other things. Um, obviously it's not, not, not quite the same for you guys, um, but friends can be really, uh, really important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so friend, I, I like to say, people don't quite know what to say, quite what, how to approach you. Um, but friends can be really important in supporting you, I don't know, coming with you to the hospital, um, they can spend the day with you, you could go out somewhere for the day, and just get away from the whole cancer thing, the whole being in hospital, and, and just, just be you again, just be normal. Um, and I, I don't like the word normal, sorry, I shouldn't have said that, because you're not abnormal. When you have cancer, you're not abnormal. If anybody tells you that you can go back to normal after cancer, tell them, Sam says, no, that's wrong, because you're not abnormal. You just got cancer. You haven't. You're not. You're know, not different from anybody else. You just got cancer. Um, so make sure you tell them, okay? Um, so friends, I I made my uh, friends because, like I say, lots of people move on. Um, I'm only now to briefly mention this before I get told off. Um, I help now. I'm a patient volunteer uh, at the Royal Surrey. Uh, it's something called the Teenage and Young Adults Cancer Group. Group. Um, anybody been to Onslow Ward? or Chilworth, or around there. Um, that's, at, that's at the Royal Surrey. Uh, our, our unit is just up there. Uh, we have three, three day, day unit uh, beds. Um, and what I do is I arrange social events for our, for our group. Um, like uh, Carol said, a lot of uh, the cinema, and uh, going out for meals, and stuff like that. Um, but it's the way that I've made my now best friends is through that group. Um, and that's a support group, so there's no reason, just because we're young and we, we have a support group, why you guys come be in a support group. Um, there, there's so many things out there, I mean, just looking outside, you saw all the stalls on your way in, and I'm sure you've been around them a few times now. 
Um, there's so much out there. Um, you just got to find it, and you've got to you've got to want to um, sort of join together and, and, and get through this because you can do it, and it's a whole lot easier with somebody's help. Uh, for for young people, it's really important um, to talk to each other. Um, so maybe speak to somebody who may have been through the same thing as you're going through, uh, or are going through the same thing as you're going through. Um, and again, that can reflect in you guys. There's no reason why you can't speak to each other even today. It's a perfect opportunity to, to have a chat. I'm sure you did over lunch. Um, but if you have a free moment or at the end, take somebody's number. Say, do you want to meet up? Do you want to? We can try and do something with it. it it's so so much help to have that person there or or group of people that you can meet with um, and just talk about it. Uh, You'll, you'll go off topic and you won't be even talking about cancer before you even know it and, and you'll be making friends in it and it really, really helps um, to, to, to have that. Um, obviously, like I say, we've got that at, at our unit, um, but there's no reason you can't do that. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about um, is something called PMA. Has anybody heard that of that before? I'll tell you what it means. Positive Mental Attitude. Now, I think that is so important, I can't emphasise it enough, how important I think that is. Um, even in the face of what, what, we've all, what we're all going through, I've had cancer twice, and I'm 22, so I know what it's like, I've been there. Um, but you have to stay positive, uh, even in those darkest, darkest hours, uh, where you think, oh, I'm never going to get out of this hospital, I'm going to be here forever. Um, I'm literally going to be here forever, you're not. There, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel, you will get out of that hospital, you will get out of this situation, and you'll carry on your lives. And you've just got to be positive, positive, positive. And all those little moments when you think, I just can't do this, or I, I, I wish this would just bugger off and leave me alone. Just think, PMA, you, you've got to, you can just see me in your head if you like, a lot of people do that. Um, but you can just keep the image, yeah? Um, and just, say, keep, just keep saying it to yourself over and over again in your head. Positive mental attitude, it's so, so crucial um, to, to, to getting through this, yeah? Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about, um, when you get cancer, I think, as well as all the medical treatment and everything, uh, which people take a lot of interest in, so the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, whatever else you've had, surgery, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole thing that people miss, um, and I think it, it is so important, sometimes even more important, um, and that's the mental side of things. Um, and it, it's, it's how you're feeling on a particular day, you, you need to be able to express that. Um, and again, there's so many people out there, I, I've seen on your list of who's coming later, a lady called Catherine May. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist, and uh, she helped me through some tough, tough stuff. Um, but she, she is great, so you're, you're really lucky to have her coming to talk to you later. Um, so look out for that one. Um, what cancer takes away from you, I, I think, um, and I've seen in a lot of young people that I help uh, at our group, is confidence. Your confidence to, I don't know, go out uh, to the cinema, go, obviously, you can't go to the cinema too much if you're neutropenic, don't do that, otherwise I'll get all the medical people shouting at me. So um, don't go there if you're the neutropenic. Um, but just to go out and, and have a good time. You are allowed to go and have a good time. If you feel like it and you are well enough, you are allowed, it's not banned. Nobody says you can't go. Um, and confidence is so important to get it back. And I, when, when you finish treatment, um, a lot of the time people think you're done. You've done your chemotherapy, you've done your radiotherapy. Nice one, back to life, sorted. But it's not like that, we know it's not like that. Um, and what you need to do is when you finish treatment, you need to either seek the help that's out there, like I say, there's loads of things out there uh, for you, um, or get together, meet with people, uh, and it's really difficult because throughout your treatment you have doctors, nurses, um, all sorts of different, you have dietitians today, you've had physiotherapists, they're all there for you, they think <coughs> they're everything for you, all, all through the day, all through the steps, yeah, they're right there for you. Finish your treatment, they're gone. They're not there for you anymore. You go and see them every, I don't know, three months, four, six months, whatever, um, however, however often, it, often it is. But they, 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 they don't make the decisions for you anymore. You've got to start making decisions for yourself again. 
Um, and that can be really difficult uh, if you've lost your sort of confidence, but you've got to, you've got to try and get it back. Um, an amazing way to do that is to speak to each other, speak to other people, um, and just get out there. You can do it. Get back out there, get back on the horse, uh, and do it. Um, and that's it, really. That's really my message. Just PMA, PMA. Every time you're feeling a bit down, just picture my lovely face in your head and think, oh, yeah, I remember what Sam said. Be positive. Oh, my God. <laughs> show you my eyes. Completely blind now. I can't see you, thank you very much for listening. When I talk, by the way, I do cut a bit of public speaking. I tend to walk around a little bit. I apologise for that. It's not because I'm nervous. It just keeps you awake. Because <laughs> <laughs> you wonder where I'm going to go next. And I might walk around and then it just keeps you on your toes. But that's a strange slide, isn't it? When I said my like today, happy birthday. That's my story. Um, just over 12 months ago, uh, I had a big birthday. Uh, I had a big birthday. I had a lot of big birthday celebrations. Had a lot of big hangovers to boot. And my life was great. I'm a rugby fanatic, as you can probably tell with my figure. Um, I've actually worked in this. My doctor said the other day, uh, having you know, recovering from uh, cancer, that I'm looking really well. And I said, normally, two years ago, I mean, if you'd said, if I'd walked in like this, you'd say, you're overweight, Steve, you're losing weight, uh, which is quite ironic. And, come on the next slide, I, I could do it, but. A short time after I got a belated birthday card, and that's what popped in my door. I was fine, I was perfect, I was very happy. Um, there's an irony around this, because my wife, who was younger than me, not that much younger, but younger than me, before you get the wrong idea, um, <laughs> is in a bowel screening program because of familial bowel cancer within the family. And we've lived with it ever since we've been together. And this pops in the door, and you know what happened, <coughs> didn't you? My wife said to me, do that. And I went, yeah, okay, darling, can I draw? Just, but I didn't put it in the drawer, and I did do it. And, and very soon after, with no symptoms at all, I was diagnosed with bowel cancer. Bowel cancer that needed quite rapid surgery. Um, and I also ended up then having had the surgery and a resection uh, with a stoma. Uh, and therefore, for those people who don't know what a stoma is, it means you've got a bag full of what's it on your belly for a little while, which I know some people in this room still have. And that's why I put the birthday slide up, because there I was in my own little life, I'm going to Frimley Park Hospital for a colonoscopy, which is what I did as a result of this test gone back and being abnormal. Um, those wonderful words, you have cancer, were uttered to me. I walked out of the hospital and I cried. I don't want to admit that. I don't want to admit that I cried. I'm a man. But I cried. And I thought, whoa, that's not what I expected. And I sat in the car, I live actually in Sussex, and I sat in the car with my wife who was driving. And I thought, what do I do about this? What do I actually do? Do I sit in the corner and cry <coughs> and let this beat me? Or do I go out there and say, okay, let's find out what I've got. Let's accept the treatment. Let's look at what I can do to actually take cancer with me and see what I can do about it. Can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. That's why I decided in the car from February Park to, to Horsham, I was going home, that I was going to be positive about this. The decisions that all you people have made, how, how, how much do I tell somebody? How much do I say to people, this is what I've got? Gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you. Gentlemen, ladies, excuse this, I don't mean this in any way, shape or form, crude. Between the age of 15 and 35, a man can talk about nothing except what below his, is below his belt. It fascinates us. It rules our lives. When we get past 35 and 40, we don't talk about it. Oh, no, don't go No, we don't. You okay? You're fine, you sit you've got the toll up. No, I'm fine, I'm cool, yeah, it's just I'm gonna this today. What do we do? What do we say? Do we share with people what we're actually gonna talk about? And I made a decision that I was gonna tell my friends and my family exactly what was going on. All the way through. Even when I was wearing a bag full of you know what on my belly, my friends that I go to rugby with, the friends that I meet down a pub, our social friends, I told them. I didn't labour it very much but I took them with me on what I call, and this word is used so much, isn't it, my journey. My journey to try and beat bowel cancer. So, Sam's already mentioned it. I cannot emphasize enough, be positive. And being positive means you do one thing that's very important. We have fantastic people around us. I'm sorry I'm moving around. I'm making the camera lady busy. We have wonderful people in this hotel with us today. The people that actually put this show together and the support we get. Ignore me, understand, I'm just a volunteer, the volunteers for 
bowel cancer. The important people that I spoke to say, the dietitians, the physiotherapists, the psychologists, it sounds like. Great people. But we have to take responsibility for our cancer. We have to do that, people. We've got to say to ourselves, I'm going to take responsibility for this. I'm going to listen. I'm going to watch. And if I don't know, I'm going to ask. I'm going to find out, and I'm going to take responsibility. We have to do that, and that's my power of positivity. It's nothing to do with positive vibes coming from somewhere. It's actually saying, this is mine. I've got it. I'm going to live with it. Fantastic. Not a particularly good slide, but as you can see, I do an awful lot of stats on slides. I'm actually an analyst uh, by trade, or I was an analyst by trade, and as you can see, I do an awful lot of stats and, and data and all that, because I know I've sat there and things like this, and people put data and stats up and go, oh my God, what's, what's happening now? A group of friends, Sam again has mentioned this, and I'm grateful that he did. A group of friends that are close to you, and a group of friends that <coughs> you need a new support, and be with those friends. It's great when you stand, when you're on a stand, and I've done a couple of these events now, that people bring their carers and their family and their friends with them. Because you can talk then to their friends as well. And people will do that and it's easier to do. It's far easier to do. There is one word of warning. My wife, who's fantastic and support me to this, as, as we all have fantastic partners, <coughs> sent me one day, do you know what, Steve? It's all about you. I walked down the street and all everybody ever says to me now is, how's Steve? We go out, and all people say is, how are you? Beaten bowel cancer last month had a big campaign called Hidden Heartache. And that's the hidden heartache of the carers and the people that support us, even your friends that support you. It's so vitally important that we, as the patients, stay with them and appreciate it's difficult for them too. It's difficult to be somebody who stands alongside somebody who has cancer and live with it as well. It's a very difficult thing to do. So. Hidden Heartache was a campaign. I didn't put that on the board because that's quite a strong term. What I put there was a group of friends. And let's bear in mind as patients, we have to be wary that they have feelings too. And they do have feelings. They have a lot of feelings. And sometimes when we have our dark moments, and my word, do we have dark moments, people? <coughs> they have dark moments too. My wife didn't say that because she was feeling neglected or left out. She just said, that's our life now. Make the effort. If you meet some friends and you're with your partner, you're with your carers, you're with your family, talk about them first. And as Sam rightly said, funny enough, cancer doesn't get mentioned. It moves on, it's quite good. I'm nearly finished. Uh, I love this film, really quite. For those people who can't remember it, Twins. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the late great Danny DeVito. And this, of course, was all, if, if you haven't seen the film, this was all about two guys that met each other and found out that they were actually biological twins. And if anything looks, uh, to, two people are totally different, it's those. All of us in the room are the same. <coughs> Sorry, all the patients in the room are the same. We all have something called cancer. Yet we're all different. Every one of us copes with the disease that we have differently. The types of cancer are different. Each type of cancer produces its own side effects, produces its own problems, produces its own psychological problems. So whilst we're all the same, and we are labelled the same as cancer patients, every single one of us is different. We could all sit down and give our stories, and every single one would be, or some would be very diverse to others, even with the same type of cancer. So, what do we do because it is different? We look at the signposts that are out there. We look like I did. I've never had to ring a helpline, but I've had to look one up on the internet sometimes, just to know they're there. Use the Q&As on the wonderful websites we've got. Don't go searching your problems on Wikipedia. Wikipedia lies. Please don't do that. I work in the school, and the kids do Wikipedia homework, and my word, it's like a, it's like a fairy tale. <laughs> so don't look it up. Do not look it up on Wikipedia. Please, please, please do not look anything up on Wikipedia. Look at Macmillan, look at beaten bowel cancer, look at prostate, look at whatever you want to look at. Look at the proper sites and, this, and look at their Q&As. If ring the specialist nurses, there's always somebody somewhere that will tell you, do you know what, you're not the only one who's got that. Because because we're different, we're the same. Support, listen, ask, watch, and take responsibility, people. It's our cancer, we can beat it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, unfortunately, I haven't got quite as many pretty pictures as Steve and uh, Sam. Um, there's quite a lot of information on these slides, but it's just about taking a general message from this. Um, <coughs> we'll move around afterwards if people have specific questions as well. Um, you've hopefully all seen some of the exercise stands out in the, in the uh, atrium as well. So, uh, stop me if you've got anything burning, but otherwise we'll we'll get moving. So, um, just hopefully we're going to go through some basics around why you should be getting active, which is essentially the message of today. Um, touch on cancer prevention, because it's certainly a question that comes up quite often. Talk about what is physical activity and how much you should be doing, and in terms of how much, how hard should you be working. Um, and also looking at some of the barriers to activity, which many of you may be thinking that you can't possibly think about exercising, and hopefully from this you'll get an idea that you can. Um, and also looking at specifically cancer-related fatigue, a little bit of things that can help you be safe and any questions you've got. So, essentially the message is that with any cancer treatment, you're potentially going to be giving yourself a, a risk of kind of developing just those bog standard problems that unfortunately come with getting that little bit older. Um, and this is the same for younger cancer patients as well. Um, but there are risks of sort of side effects for your treatment. For example, high blood pressure, higher risk of stroke, diabetes, kidney disease, and psychologically, depression and anxiety. Um, and really it's understanding that physical activity, irrespective of your cancer diagnosis, can help with these sort of bulk standard health related complications uh, as a starting point. So getting active, it can really help manage some of those side effects of your treatment. As I say, I'll talk about cancer related fatigue separately, um, but it's really taking that message home that getting tired through activity is, is actually going to help with those feelings of fatigue. Exercise produces wonderful happy drugs within your body, the same as if you eat bar of chocolate or have a bit of cake. Um, and it can really help with feelings of anxiety, depression, and actually improve your mood. Um, it can improve bone health and joint health, and also help prevent against complications such as osteoporosis. Doesn't mean you won't develop these things, but it can certainly help or go some way to alleviate the symptoms. It can improve heart health, uh, builds muscle strength, and just helps you maintain a healthy weight alongside other things such as our wonderful uh, information from our dietitian Lindsay. So, cancer prevention. Lots of people talk about what can I do to stop my cancer coming back? And the answer for lots of people is we simply don't know. However, in terms of evidence suggesting that exercise will help your cancer stay at bay or, or may stop it coming back. We know that having a healthy lifestyle and making some of these different changes in your life can certainly help reduce risks in terms of uh, either cancer relapse or, or in, indeed getting a cancer in the first place. But it's understanding that the evidence, the really solid evidence that says it definitely works is tiny and small and very specific. And we don't want you to try and focus on it I've had prostate cancer, what can I do to stop that coming back? These are really general things, but we know that healthy lifestyle and activity is going to do absolutely a world of good for all of you, irrespective of cancer diagnosis. So, what is physical activity? <laughs> That's how most of us feel, isn't it? So what sorts of, it's just having a think about the sorts of things. Anything other than what we're doing right now, or except me because I'm standing up, but Anything other than what you're doing right now is physical activity. Walking up the stairs in your house, walking around the supermarket, just getting up and moving around your living room is activity. And it's about taking those small changes and making them that little bit bigger. Um, there are specific things you can be doing and they will have very sort of specific benefits depending on either the type of symptoms you suffer with or problems you may have generally. So things like resistance or strength exercises, and this is what most of us think of, someone in the gym lifting heavy weights. Um, and strengthening your, your muscles will help support your joints, it helps help support bone strength um, and bone health. But there's simple things you can be doing, and it might just be picking up a can of beans, picking up a bottle of water, um, Simple exercises involving TheraBand, which is a great big elastic bands, which you might see in the gym. But it doesn't have to be lifting barbells and heaving and going blue in the face. Um, so as I say, exercise can be done with hand weights, there's supportive machines, and 
there's things you can be doing at home that are going to help build the strength. What we're talking about is loading your muscles, making them work that little bit harder. Flexibility is something that helps just support your general health and again your bone strength and joint strength. Um, and actually it's a really nice starting point when you've been <coughs> unwell if you've not been very active. So we think about people who go for a jog and everyone sees them limbering up and stretching, probably quite badly, but just stretching as part of a healthy lifestyle can really go some way to making your body feel a little bit freer, finding things easier to move around and therefore kind of taking away some of those barriers that might stop you doing more energetic exercise. Um, so yeah, flexibility, moving your joints through their range. And there's things like yoga, which most of us heard of, doesn't again mean you need to stand in some terrifying pose balanced on your head <laughs> with one foot in the air. It can be really simple. Uh, and there are things like Tai Chi and Qigong, which are movement-based exercises, slow, they include relaxation, <coughs> breathing, and there are things like this that are now being targeted specifically for people who've had cancer. Um, but there are groups, sort of non-cancer related groups, who will, who will be able to tailor things for you if you speak to them. Um, as I say, they combine things like breathing techniques, which when we come on to cancer related fatigue, can be really helpful. Um, balance exercises, again, it doesn't mean, you know, swinging from the rafters or swinging on a trapeze. Um, it's just about getting your body to remember to keep you upright. Um, and especially if you've had certain chemotherapies where maybe the nerves in your feet aren't working so well, um, actually working on balanced exercises can really help support you in being more active. So the biggest thing is thinking about how much should you be doing. So it depends on how fit you are, depends on how fit you were before your treatment or before your diagnosis. Um, depends on the symptoms that you might be experiencing and the side effects you might be experiencing. Things like bone loss as well, which we'll talk about later. So there's this terrifying general advice, two and a half to three hours a week, which is a really huge number. And that's half an hour a day for most people of moderate to vigorous intensity. So getting knackered every single day for half an hour, which seems like a terrifying amount to fit in. The point is, any more than you're doing now is increasing your physical activity. If you go and have a walk around the block twice a week, doing it three times a week, is increasing the amount you do. Obviously, if you're already somebody that decides that you know, training for marathons is your thing and you're doing five, six, <coughs> ten hours a week, um, you're probably doing enough. Uh, but just thinking about increasing is the thing. But as I said, it's the small changes that add up that most of us are doing. So walking up and down the stairs more than you need to. So if you've got a bathroom upstairs and a bathroom downstairs and you're not in a rush, walk up the stairs. When you've been or you've gone to get something from upstairs, come down, go back up again. Little changes like this add up and you'd be really surprised how quickly those changes feed into how much energy you have and how you feel. So getting off a bus, a stop earlier than you need to, um, especially if it's on a hill. Uh, marching on the spot whilst the kettle boils. Most of us have a kettle that's going to take a couple of minutes. In those couple of minutes, you can get out of breath. If you get out of breath, you're working harder than you are when you're standing still. If you're working harder, your heart has to work harder, and you improve your, your exercise once you start to get fitter. Uh, exercising in advert breaks, and if anybody watches you know, normal television, commercial television, you'll find that there's a, an ad break every five minutes. Well, that's an awful lot of exercise you can be doing, walking around your living room, marching on the spot, put the kettle on, go upstairs, come back down, make a cup of tea, you're back in time for the next bit of your program, but by that point you've got out of breath and you need a rest. Or putting a song on, having a dance, whatever you like. And as Sam said, you know, going out with friends, if it's going out with friends and having a dance, perfect. So, exercise intensity, and this is a really key thing. At the moment we're all exercising at a zero intensity. I'm not really doing a lot either, but might be that walking out to the car park, for some of you, you barely even notice it. But for some of you, it might be you walk out to the car park, you start to get that quicker breathing. You start to feel like you're warming up. It's getting hard work, and you're probably working at a moderate intensity. The harder you go, and the more out of breath you get, and the redder in the face you go, 
the harder you're working. Um, and actually, uh, I think somebody has in one of their, their pamphlets outside something called the Borg scale, and it shows you how hard you're working. You want to be working at this moderate to higher intensity for some of your time during the week and understand that getting breathless is a safe thing to do. For those of you that have experienced <coughs> breathlessness as a complication of your treatment, breathlessness through exercise is not a bad thing. You might experience it just doing a small amount, but it's not going to do you any harm. Working at a sensible level that gets you just that little bit out of breath, so you can just about hold a conversation. You might not be able to sing a song, but hold a conversation. But it should recover afterwards. And that's a normal thing to experience breathlessness through exercise. What you don't want to do is find that you've done too much and you can't do anything the next day. And we're all going to find that that limit's different for us, but it's safe to take it to that point, realise you overdid it, I'll do less next time. So, barriers to activity. This is a really big thing. Most of, uh, sort of, most of the people we work with who've either had a cancer diagnosis or going through cancer treatment feel very anxious about going back to the gym, doing any exercise because they think it's going to affect their cancer treatment. The chances are it may well help you during your cancer treatment and your experience of side effects. But certainly, okay. uh, people find that anxiety is a huge, huge issue when it comes to getting back to being more active. It might be you were never active to start with, but this is the time to start. Certainly motivation is a key thing. We can't motivate you and just tell you to do it, but hopefully days like this, if, you know, hearing all the information you've got might help you overcome motivation. Time and money are huge issues, and certainly um, we've got citizens advice outside. Going through cancer treatment is an expensive business for some people, and finding the money to then go and spend doing an exercise class or going to the gym can feel really, really overwhelming. But actually there's really good access to either free groups or um, sort of funded groups that will help you get more active and we've got two groups outside so the Surrey Sports Park uh, and uh, a class run in Woking specifically designed for people who've had cancer treatment or are ongoing cancer treatment um, where the people have been trained in cancer care and understand the different problems that you might have and those are GP referral systems so uh, much more sort of subsidised costs. It's not sort of paying 30, 40, 50 pounds a month to go to a gym. There's all sorts of help available. Um, obviously, different health conditions. <laughs> Body image can be a big one, depending on the on the type of treatment. As Steve mentioned, that he had a stoma as part of his treatment. And we know that things like this, people think of lycra-clad, you know, toned individuals in the gym. The point is anybody can exercise and actually nobody's looking at you in the gym especially if you go where there's a group of people who have all been in the same way um, but there is support out there and cancer related to you so in terms of body image it can affect the way you look it can affect the way your body works it can affect the way your body feels um, and for some people they they don't find this a problem for a lot of people small changes in their body can be a real barrier to kind of um, getting out there and, and being seen. We've got the, the um, team from, what's the body image team out there? Look good, feel better. Look good, feel, Look good, feel better. better. Look good. Out there. Um, and, and again, so like, you know. Call it the body image team. <laughs> so there's a great team out there with, with some advice and tips. And it could be simply accessing things like getting the right prosthesis to go in a swimming costume or um, sort of just talking to different people and understanding that they're all in the same boat. Um, cancer related fatigue so this is a, a really big thing um, it's an almost universal symptom of people undergoing any anti-cancer treatment it can have a huge you know, profound effect on the whole person and it can persist for years after completion of treatment and that's not to terrify people um, but it, it's just to acknowledge that this is a big problem for some people but it's multifactorial, so there's lots of reasons why people can experience cancer-related fatigue. And to be honest, we don't 100% understand why people experience the symptoms in the way they do. We know it's unique to the individual, um, and it's not just because you've overdone it one day. 
Uh, there's lots of reasons why you might experience fatigue. So hopefully that's, I'm assuming there's things on there that, that seem quite familiar to a lot of people. Um, so this is just a kind of snapshot of, of things that people tell us and report to us that they've experienced. Um, Does that seem quite familiar to some people? They don't want to own up to any of these symptoms. There's a few nods around the room. Yeah. Um, so contributing to these, what can cause this? Obviously, chemotherapy and radiotherapy is, is kind of biological treatments. They have their own you know, physiological side effects. We're doing something to your body and your body's going to respond. On top of that, there's the cancer that you've been diagnosed with, the specific site of disease. But you've got all the other side effects as a knock-on. So the anxiety and stress of going through your diagnosis, the treatment, the aftercare, experiencing low mood as a result of that, possibly ongoing pain, disturbed sleep, poor diet is a, is a huge factor in fatigue, pressures of work, pressures of work and family and just day-to-day -day commitments. And also, probably one of the biggest things, inactivity. Um, Fatigue breeds fatigue. The less you do, the more tired you feel, the less you feel you can do. So what can you be doing? So, for those of us who experience poor sleep or insomnia, many, many causes, but just having a think about sleep hygiene. So if you know you're not experiencing good quality sleep, it's gonna have a knock-on effect when you feel knackered the next day. So, try not to have caffeine in the afternoons. It's really tempting at three, four in the afternoon, you feel tired, have a coffee. Five, six in the evening, have a coffee, feel that little bit more awake. But the knock-on effect is, is it can really disturb your sleep patterns later on, even if you feel like you don't have caffeine in your system. So what we try and say is, after sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, try and switch to decaf if you can. Um, alcohol consumption can lead to really poor sleep quality. Um, Sam and his mates and youngsters, if they're out having a a drink, they might feel that they get a little bit sleepy and maybe even pass out, but the sleep they have is really poor quality. So many people like to enjoy a drink. Fantastic, we're not saying don't do it, but think about how much you're having and if you start to find that you're needing a drink to get to sleep, the sleep you're having probably is not very good quality at all. Try and avoid daytime naps. We know that people going through their treatments may find that this is next to impossible to achieve. If you really, really need a nap, have a nap. But if you're just in the habit of cat napping, just because it's one of those things you do, and then you don't sleep, think about seeing if you can stay awake. And if you do decide to go and have a nap during the day, make it good quality. Go to bed, draw the curtains, make it dark, turn off the TV, avoid distractions, and actually get a proper kit. Set an alarm, have an hour. 15 minutes here and there, and the upshot is you feel more tired at the end of the day than you did without a nap. Um, keep bedtime, and, and keep to a bedtime sort of waking routine, so try and make things regular. But also keep bedtime for sleeping. So if you like to read a book and watch TV, do that on your sofa, do that in the kitchen. Keep bedtime for sleeping, otherwise we tend to associate going to bed with doing those things and not sleeping. Um, and if you can't get to sleep, get up and have another go at it. So if you've been in bed for two hours and you're still awake, get up, do something else, give yourself half an hour, make a cup of tea, decaf of course, um, and go back to bed and have a second go and you may find that you get back into a regular sleep pattern that way. But obviously as a physiotherapist and obviously with this presentation, the key thing here is <coughs> exercise can really improve your sleep patterns. So getting tired for exercise rather than getting tired for being tired can help you sleep. Um, and don't go to bed too hungry or too thirsty. On the flip side, too full or too hydrated. And this is a tricky one. Don't drink just before bed and find you waking up at one o'clock in the morning to go to the loo. But equally, don't stop drinking and eating at four o'clock in the afternoon and go to bed starving. You'll wake up, you'll need something. And that again will disturb your sleep. Relaxation techniques. Hugely important for lots of people for all manner of reasons in terms of um, your general health and well-being, but also your psychological health. Um, and breathing exercises is a really useful, kind of simple 
meditation tool. You don't have to go and sit and chant and be into yoga and you know breathing exercise is a really good way of just getting control of a situation, just bringing anxiety levels down. And actually the Macmillan stand at the back has a really lovely booklet on breathing exercises. And for those of you who experience breathlessness, it also has some really sensible ways of approaching <coughs> breathlessness in relation to your diagnosis. Um, things like meditation, guided visualisation, mindfulness. These are sort of techniques that you can be taught, but just to be aware of that they're there. Um, the other thing to do is picture Sam's face with his PMA, <laughs> positive mental attitudes, and that's a really other a good way of, of promoting your own health. Um, this is a really sensible slide, pacing yourself. We want you to do more, but we want you to think about how much you, you're going to be doing and what you need to do day to day. And it's a really good idea to break, break your task down during the day. If you know you don't have a lot of energy, pick and choose how you use your energy. It's almost like it's a, we all have an energy account for the day. Most of us don't have unlimited funds in it, so be sensible about how you spend it. So think about what are the things I must do today? What should I do and what could I do that I might leave for another time? Or break down your tasks. Is it something I can do in stages? Can I do an hour, have a break, go for a walk around the block, have a rest, eat a balanced lunch, and then carry on and do it later on. Um, and can someone help you? So Sam and, and Steve were talking about support networks. If you need to do day-to-day -day things, if you were moving house or you were decorating when you got your diagnosis and you put it all on hold with the treatment, you might still have things you need to do, but you probably don't feel like you can accomplish it all on your own. Can someone else help you? And um, lastly, just think about being safe. The side effect of lots of anti-cancer treatments are numerous. But for some people, you might have experienced bony-related problems. Um, and just thinking about the exercise options available to you, if you know you've got bony problems, try to avoid high-impact activities. If you're a runner before, um, and you enjoy jogging, think about doing things like going on a cross-trainer. It looks like jogging. Your body responds in the same way, but you're not pounding the pavement, and you're not putting a shot through your joints. Um, if you've got problems in your back or you've maybe had some, some areas that you've had treatment in your back, avoid bending. So don't do a vigorous yoga class, but go and do something a little more balanced. Um, peripheral neuropathy, so this is nerve damage that some people experience with chemotherapy. Again, it's not, it doesn't mean you can't do any exercise, it just means be aware that if you can't feel your feet or your fingers so well, you might need to do a, a less balanced challenging activity or work on some specific balance exercises before you go out and, you know, before you start jogging or before you start uh, going on a wobble board in the gym. So things to just be safe. The other thing is lymphedema. So for people that have experienced lymphedema as a result of their, either their, their treatment, their surgery, or just as a result of where their, their cancer is, you might be someone that wears a pressure garment. Lymphedema and exercise are, um, are not incompatible, it's just being sensible. So if you have a pressure garment, wear your pressure garment when you exercise. Don't do lots of exercises just on that one affected limb. Um, and things like strengthening and stretching are just as safe for you to do, but just make sure pressure garments are on, don't do things on one side. Um, and the last thing is just be aware of if you're on anticoagulant medications, so if you're, most of you will know if you are, um, just avoiding things where you might be knocked over. So possibly don't go and play rugby, or if you do, just play touch. Um, but just be sensible about the activities you're undertaking. You know, don't do high impact activities where you might get knocked over. But that said, if you if you feel safe, you know your balance is good, and you want to go for a jog, absolutely go and do it. So. The overall message from today is that move more. Do more than you're doing now. Do more than you did yesterday. Through your treatment and beyond, it's a really sensible thing to keep you healthy and hopefully happy. Um, and as I say, outside in, in the atrium, there are different classes now that are available where people have been trained in cancer care. They understand the different problems that you might experience, but it means you're probably going to be 
in a group of like-minded individuals. And going to a gym or doing exercise class feels really overwhelming, thinking, well, oh, they don't know what I've just been through yesterday or what I've got to do tomorrow. But actually, there's these classes available now where you're in a room full of people like today, a support network like Sam had, of friends and people who've been through the same, same treatments or similar treatments and will understand. And exercising in that supportive environment can be a really good way of building your confidence and just getting back to the So, that's me. Hello, thank you for having me. I know you're pretty tired by now. This is the last bit you've got to get through. Ooh. My name's Annie. Uh, I've been a radiographer for about 15 years now. So I'm just going to quickly run through um, how we can help support you before, during and after <coughs> your treatment. So, before your treatment starts, you will come to the department, you'll have a scan, um, and, and during that, that first appointment, people are going to explain things to you, because obviously it's quite frightening, no one's really ever seen a, uh, a radiotherapy machine before, but they're going to explain a lot to you about what happens. So it's a really good time there to ask questions. Perhaps come with questions written down because once you get there, you might have forgotten them. So it's always a good tip to write them down so that when you arrive, you've got them ready. Um, so there's a little picture there of the scanner. And then you have a little break. There's, a, there's some time in between your scan and before your treatment starts. Um, so you can kind of get yourself ready for treatment starting. Um, and then on your first day, before you actually have your treatment, again, someone's going to sit down with you, they're going to go through the whole process of what's going to happen that day, answer any questions you've got, and just give you a, you know, a good idea of what's going to happen. So hopefully, by the time you come into the treatment room, nothing's going to surprise you, um, you're going to know what's going to happen, and you're going to feel relaxed and ready for treatment. Um, we do do department tours and introduction evenings, so if you haven't had any treatment yet and you think that's something that you would like to um, do, then ring the department and you can arrange to come on one of those tours. We normally do those in conjunction with the Fountain Centre, who I know have spoken to you already. So the Fountain Centre is one of our very best resources for supporting you throughout your whole journey with us at St Luke's. Um, and I know they've spoken to you already, but just to re-emphasise, they are fabulous. Um, they offer so many different treatments, and they all know about the other treatments that you will be having. So they're not going to offer you anything which you can't actually have. So they're a really good, really good supportive place to go. So what can you do? There's been quite a lot of talk about ownership of your... Um, diagnosis, ownership of your treatment. So I was trying to think to myself, what would be the perfect patient to come into our department? You will be eating well, drinking well, resting well, and you won't have believed everything that you would have heard and been told and seen on Wikipedia. Um, so eating well, Lindsay's already had a really good chat with you about that. Ideally, we, when you're on treatment, we do not want you to lose weight. This is, now is not the time when you're having radiotherapy. <coughs> so it might be that that's a goal for you after you've finished your treatment, but it's important that your shape stays the same while you're on treatment with us. So we want you to be just maintaining a good weight, a good healthy weight. Drink well. If anyone here's had radiotherapy already, they will know. We tell you, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Drinking water solves almost every problem. So we really want you to arrive with us in a really good drinking regime. So you know you want your two and a half litres of fluids out, spread out over the day. I know, it's hard. It feels like no, a lot of water. Impossible. So that, that's um, something that you will be told when you come to us. Resting well, we've had some information about that already. It's not always about having a nap in the day. Um, but it's just having really good sleep, but also not overdoing it. You are coming for treatment, and whilst radiotherapy doesn't always feel that invasive, it is an extra burden on your body, and we don't want you too tired. Um, and yes, radiotherapy has moved on so hugely in the last, well, 15 years I've been doing it. It's massively different, and the media really lags behind in what it tells you, in what you'll see in a movie or a soap or 
you know, those sorts of things. You see dreadful radiation burns and this, that and the other. And it, and it is not, it's not like that. So don't be too frightened about what you, um, if you see anything in the, in the media about that sort of thing. But do come and ask us questions and we will give you a really honest answer about what to expect. So, during your treatment, that, that picture is a machine, a uh, linear accelerator, so that's what you get your treatment on. Um, so, supportive care during radiotherapy. We have a review team. Um, I'm one of the review team. Um, so, while you're on your treatment, most things come through us, and then we will direct you into the right place. We have a massive team at St. Luke's. Consultants, pain teams, physiotherapy, Salt is speech and language, dietitians, peg nurses, CNSs, occupational therapy. You know, there's a huge amount of resources available to you. And when you're on radiotherapy, you tend to come via us and we will direct you to the right place. So just some of you may be you know, about to embark on a little radiotherapy treatment. So just really briefly, radiotherapy only affects the area of the body which is being treated. So unlike chemo, which is going to affect everything, radiotherapy is not like that. So whichever bit you're having treated, that's the side effects. That's where they're going to come from. So um, they start approximately seven to ten days after you finish <coughs> treatment and can last up to six weeks till you fit after you finish. General side effects would be fatigue, which we've heard a lot about already, and an inflammation of the skin, um, which can just be vary from a bit of pinkening to being, you know, quite sore. Um, so that's sort of a general overview. Another reason why you can't believe, well, it's not you can't believe everything you hear, but everybody is so different, and that's the thing I've got to stress to you. Every treatment is different. Every patient reacts differently to the treatment. So ask your radiographers before you get too stressed about a side effect that you think might be coming. Ask one of your radiographers. What can you do? Exactly the same. While you're on treatment, all those things. Eat well, drink well, rest well. And uh, you'll be in the waiting room and having a chat with everyone else there. But just remember, not everyone's having the same treatment. So what you hear, even in the waiting room, might not apply to you. And quickly, some common misconceptions. Will you be radioactive? No, you will not. You can see your grandchildren, your children, you can hold your babies while you're on radiotherapy treatment, that's all absolutely fine. Does it hurt? No, it doesn't. While you're on, when you're having the active treatment, you really, you won't feel a thing. Side effects can be painful, but not the actual treatment itself. Will your hair fall out? Not unless we're treating your head. Your hair is fine. Um, can you drive? Yes, lots of our patients, even coming for six weeks every day, drive themselves every day. Can you park? Probably not. <laughs> Can you work? Yes, lots of patients again do manage to maintain a perfectly normal life and keep working um, throughout their treatment. But we always sort of try and make sure that your work is understanding that if halfway through you're thinking, you know what, I'm just shattered, I need some time off, you know, we, we like to make sure that's in place as well. Okay, so when your treatment's finished, We've also heard a lot about this. I think before you start your treatment, you think, oh, I just can't wait to get to the end, can't wait to get to the end. And then the end comes, and you feel all at sea. Um, so just remember, you're not alone when you've finished. Uh, you will go away um, after your last treatment with a phone number, and you can always call back to the radiographers, um, and we will get back to you and have a chat and see how you're getting on. So always you can call the radiographers, you will have follow-up appointments with your consultants. Um, and, you know, we want you to move on and live well after you've finished with us. And we, you've heard from lots of different people about how you can do that with the Fountain Centre, with support groups. And just, I would encourage you to engage with those things. Because whilst you feel like you might not want to, you think, oh, I'm going to finish, I'm not going to want to talk about it again. You do. And, it's, and you're not being looked at every day, and it is, can be quite frightening. So you have sort of intermediate, you're not seeing nurses and radiographers anymore, but you can go to a Macmillan Centre, you can go to the Fountain Centre and meet with other people who you can talk to. Really, really important. 
Um, and then also we do run the survivorship course from the Fountain Centre as well, so that's something that you can book into if you want to.